you're tuned into Masters of the Genre, where I, Cardinal Sin, take you right to the source of the most important genre creators of their generation. Authors, actors, directors, science fiction, fantasy, comics, film, and other creators that shape our genre fiction and entertainment. Get ready to leave the world of the everyday behind and go head to head with the masters of the genre. Greetings, greetings, followers. It is I, Cardinal Sin. And with me today, I have a very special guest, Mark Scott Zacree who has written and produced hundreds of hours of series TV, pilots, and feature films for most of the major studios and networks, including Paramount, Universal, Disney, Sony, Columbia, TriStar, MGM, Warners, Castle Rock, New Line, CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox, WB, UPN, Showtime, USA Networks, the Sci-Fi Channel, the BBC, and many more. Among his credits are classic episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, Sliders, Babylon 5, Deep Space Nine, Friday the 13th, the series, Forever Night, Mantis, Space Precinct, and many others. Mark's work has been nominated for the Hugo Award, American Book Award, Humanitas Prize, the Nebula Award, and Diane Thomas Award, and has won the prestigious Hamptons Prize, TV Guide Award, Rondo Award, the Saturn Award, and he has been named a Writers Guild Diversity Honoree. In 2019, he and his Space Command team were listed in Esquire's list of top celebrities at Comic-Con. Mark's landmark book, The Twilight Zone Companion, created the modern genre of books on TV series and inspired a generation of TV showrunners and filmmakers. The Companion was an instant bestseller, over half a million copies to date, and named by the New York Times one of 10 science fiction books for the ages, the only nonfiction book on the list. The extensively updated new edition has just been released by Silman James. Silman James will also be publishing his new book, Greenlighting Yourself. Also among Mark's recent books is Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities, co-written with Guillermo del Toro for HarperCollins, which debuted as the number one movie book on Amazon. In addition, Mark is a lauded novelist with the best-selling Magic Time Trilogy published by HarperCollins and Blackstone Audio. Additionally, Mark is currently creating new TV series in collaboration with Rockne O'Bannon, Mark Fergus, and Joe Doherty called The Showrunners Network. Mark and his wife, Elaine, are also founders and for the last 26 plus years have run The Table, which has provided a supportive community to thousands of industry professionals in Hollywood and around the world at no charge. Among many projects currently in prep, production, or post, they are writing, directing, and producing Space Command, starring Doug Jones, Mike Harney, John Hennigan, Christina Moses, Farhan Tahir, James Hong, Bill Moomy, Robert Picardo, Armin Shimmerman, and Bruce Boxleitner. You can learn more about the Zacrees on Mark's Facebook and Twitter pages and on his YouTube channel, Mr. Sci-Fi. Mark Scott Zacree, welcome to Masters of the Genre. I'm glad to be here, Gil. It, uh, I'm glad that we survived uh, reading my bio. It's uh, <laughs> quite lengthy. It's uh, It sounds like uh, uh, it would take three lifetimes to do all that stuff, but I, uh, since I was there for it, it's, you know, it's, it's accurate. <laughs> It is accurate indeed, and I'm putting the link into the chat now so that people can check out more value if they like. 
and uh, we'll go ahead and dive right in. Um, before we get started, I have to admit, Mark, I'm a huge fan of your work. Thank you. And as a writer and a screenwriter myself, I'm something of a fawning fanboy. <laughs> well, so am I, actually. I mean, you know, I, I grew up in the genre, and the three shows that made me want to be a writer were Star Trek, Outer Limits, and Twilight Zone, the original versions of all three. And uh, so I, I, I completely, and I, I noticed that the writers writing those shows were also writing the, the books that I was reading and, and loved. So, um, so I came up very much as a fan. Absolutely. Well, I'll do my best to maintain... Uh, a professional atmosphere, although uh, Masters of the Genre is really more of a, a casual conversation yeah. than a formal interview. Uh, so um, I, I wanted to get started with Mr. Sci-Fi. Your YouTube sure. page, uh, Mr. Sci-Fi, has hundreds of videos, Yes, many about working with luminaries like Ronald D. Moore and Harlan Ellison, yeah. how to write and sell TV shows, movies, and books, Life Lessons from Rod Serling, Ray Bradbury, and Guillermo del Toro, a one-day class. It's a veritable treasure trove for creatives in genre fiction yeah. from page to screen and beyond. What made you decide to create a channel where people could learn from the benefit of your experience across so many disciplines? That's a great question. Uh, the you know My entire career, I've been very interested in in paying it forward you know and uh and mentoring others because there's so much misperception about how to have a career in film and tv and books and uh a big part of my career has been finding mentors who would uh, tell me how they succeeded whether it was serling or ray bradbury or guillermo del toro or harlan uh and um and then when i started space command which i'm sure we'll get to it was such a massive project that i wanted something that would be um, easier to do and kind of give me a little bit of a break. Just as, just as when I was uh, writing and pro producing television, I was also a commentator on Morning Edition on NPR because that gave me the ability to write something that would be three minutes long and, and just read it. And um, so one time I was having lunch a few, couple of years ago with uh, my friend Glenn Mazzara, who had been the showrunner on Walking Dead, and uh, he came. He was executive producer on The Shield, and we were just talking science fiction, just like you and I are doing. And he said, "You know, you know so much about science fiction. You should have your own YouTube channel." And uh, and it was like, "Wow, what a fun idea!" And so I found out my my, my main idea with Mister Sci Fi was to have it be almost no trouble at all to shoot. So in other words, I just turn my phone on myself. I have a full-time editor. My editor, Dave Edison, works on Space Command and all my projects. And so I just send stuff to him and he might drop in an image or whatever, but we keep it really simple. And uh, and so I'm able to do at least a video a week and often more. We just did a marathon where I presented different radio and TV versions uh, and, and feature film versions of 1984 in their entirety mm -hmm. over at once a day over a period of a little over a week and it was terrifically fun and um you know I, I love youtube it's my favorite channel because there's just so much there and uh when i was writing the twilight zone companion when i was in my early 20s to watch any of those playhouse 90s or any of that stuff from the 50s you had to go to museum you had to go to university archives and get set up on a moviola like a, a flatbed editing machine and they'd bring you a 16 millimeter or a 35 millimeter print and you'd have to watch it there. It was that rare. Now mm. you just type the title into YouTube and from nine times out of 10, you'll be able to watch it right on your own TV. So or that, on YouTube. Yes, exactly. Well, I just love YouTube. And um, so uh, so it was the idea of doing something where, because I'm, I do have a huge amount of knowledge and information at my fingertips. And also there's so many stories that friends of mine told me personally that have never been published, like Ray Bradbury told me after I became friends with him and we became very good friends, I had heard that there had been a falling out between Ray Bradbury and, and Rod Serling and neither of them ever talked about it publicly. And finally, Ray and I got to be such good friends. I said, okay, tell me, tell me what the story was, Ray. And he told me, and it was a fascinating story. And I then told it on Mr. Sci-Fi and it took a half hour to tell that story. Oh, wow. Just fascinating. So, yeah. so it's really fun to be able to share this kind of information uh, so readily. I, I really love it. Yeah. I, I actually listened to the, uh, the Vincent Price episode just the other day. Yeah. Uh, and uh, thought that that was uh, wonderful uh, fun. Yeah. 
my first experience with you was the Twilight Zone Companion. Cool. And congratulations on the third uh, edition being published. Thank you. How did you, um, how did researching the Twilight Zone, going to Rod's home, talking with Carol Sterling and rummaging around in the attic give you a new understanding on Rod, the show, and the writers? Well, it was just, it was phenomenal. Um, I, uh, as I said, I grew up uh, in the genre, reading science fiction and watching movies and TV shows and reading comics and all that stuff. And, um, and as I said, I noticed that Harlan Ellison, Ray Bradbury, Theodore Sturgeon, you know, all these names, David Gerald, um, they were writing the books I was reading and they were writing for these TV shows that I loved, Outer Limits, Star Trek, Twilight Zone. In fact, when I grew up there, there were no video recorders. And so I actually re recorded Star Trek. When it originally aired, I recorded it on reel-to-reel -reel tape. Mm -hmm. in case it never aired again. <laughs> so I'd be able to re-experience those episodes. And um, so as the, the lovely thing about science fiction, something I really truly love about it, is that most genres, and particularly mainstream fiction, if you want to meet your heroes, it's very difficult. Whereas in science fiction, most of them go to these conventions, whether mm -hmm. it's Worldcon or Comic-Con. You can Especially meet back in the day. Yes, yes, yes. And so, so uh, as soon as I was old enough to go to conventions, 15, 16 years old, I started going... And I met Harlan and I met George Clayton Johnson, who'd been one of the great writers of Twilight Zone and also wrote the first episode of Star Trek that ever aired and co-wrote Logan's Run uh, with William F. Nolan. Yep. And, and so these people became mentors and friends and Harlan uh, recommended, you know, I go to the Clarion Writers Workshop when I was 19 and I sold my first short story through that. So it was uh, it was terrific. Yes, exactly. Bill, yes. Bill Nolan is a good buddy of mine. He's a great guy. And it's, he is a great and guy. It, and it's a blessing that we still have him with us. because It is. We're losing more and more of these these unique people. And in fact, one thing I should mention in terms of Mr. Sci-Fi was one of my huge influences as a kid as a kid was Forrest J. Ackerman, who of course was editor of uh, Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. And he and had allegedly this, created the term sci-fi. Yes, he did. He created the, the term sci-fi uh, as a pun on hi-fi. And he was called Mr. Sci-Fi uh, up until his death some years ago. Ah. And so myself, Mr. Sci-Fi is very much a tip of the hat because um, if I can get someone to be curious and think if I mention Forey Ackerman as Mr. S the original Mr. Sci-Fi, maybe some people will go looking for his work or, or buy some ma you know famous monsters of Filmland magazine on eBay or whatever. I, I love the fact that I'm able to ring a bell for these incredible people who who we wouldn't be here if not for the the, the ones who went before us. And um, and I'm very glad that I can um, uh, point out people that that are worth checking out. Absolutely. I, uh, I do have, uh, photographs of, uh, me and, uh, Forey Ackerman. Mm. Um, the one that I have, um, since I didn't know you were going there, uh -huh. the one that I have access to readily is one that I took of, um, my brother and Forey Ackerman. Mm. And I will, um, oh, no, that's, that's the two of us. There's, we're both oh, in cool. there. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, there we are. Great. That's great. I mean, he and, was, uh, unique. yeah, he was hosting, um, area 1952 in Independence, Missouri, yeah. which has the largest, uh, the Glenwin has the largest indoor screen in the United States. It's 50 oh. feet tall. Wow. Wow. And uh, that night, uh, the man from Planet X was the <laughs> the uh, the film from 1952. That's so that was that was yeah, it was a lot of fun. Wow. And uh, uh, I also have a photograph, although I don't have it queued up, mm -hmm. of um, uh, uh, Forey uh, uh, looking at a laser disc of Frankenstein that I brought. <laughs> And oh. then and then signing it because he had provided bonus material wow. that apparently the studio had lost. Wow. Uh, wow. Which they put back onto the laser disc. Yeah. And the, the interesting thing about Forey was not only was he um, just instrumental in the in the genre of science fiction, I mean he loaned Ray Bradbury 
the hundred dollars that got Ray to take, be able to take the train to New York to go to the first World Science Fiction Convention when Ray was wow. I mean, that's how far back they went. And um, but when I was a kid, you know, reading the uh, famous monsters of Filmland magazine, I learned that Forey had all these um, science fiction rarities, these amazing things from science fiction and fantasy films in his house. He called it the Acker Mansion, mm -hmm. and, and that you could go there. Uh, for free, he had it open to the public and just so that he could share these wonderful things. And I remember going there as a kid, like when I was eight years old, to the first uh, Acker Mansion on Sherborne uh, in West Hollywood. And uh, and it was just phenomenal. And I remembered years later as an adult, when I went to a larger house that he had acquired subsequently, and there were things I remembered seeing as a child. And there was uh, Mr. Spock's pointed ears and the phaser from Star Trek and one of the hands of the thing from the Jim Arness version of the thing, the Howard Hawks film. And I didn't see them uh, when I went back. And I said, Foray, what happened to those? He said, oh, people stole them. And to hmm. me, to me, the fact that Foray knew that pe some people would be as loathsome to steal his things and yet still allow people to come, fans to come and share his joy of, of this and share his possessions was um, very meaningful to me that he had that kind of a heart to be able to do that. And uh, it was, it was, he was, he was one of a kind. There's, there's, we won't see his like again. And, uh, but That's you know, certainly true. Yeah. And Gil, I, I, also, I, there was a question you asked and I did want to finish answering because I didn't answer it when you were asking about writing the Twilight Zone Companion. Um, when I came out of college, I was writing, I was a, a painting, sculpture, graphic arts major. I knew I'd either be a visual artist or a writer growing up. And by the time I sold my first short story at 19 to Damon Knight, uh, I knew I wanted to be a writer, not a, not a visual artist. And so um, I uh, wanted to be a writer, producer, and TV. That's my favorite art form. And um, But there were no classes in how to do that at that time. We're talking like 1977. And uh, so uh, I thought, and I'd met George Clayton Johnson at a convention, science fiction conventions, and we'd become friends. And so I thought, and Rod Serling had died in 75, of course. And so I thought, well, maybe if I write a book about the Twilight Zone, which I'm fascinated by, maybe I can learn how to write and produce TV. And um, that proved to be the case. And um, so, uh, so George was the first person I interviewed and then he introduced me to people. And ultimately over a three month period, I interviewed 30 people. And by then I felt I knew enough to go to Carol Serling and pitch the idea of this book. Cause I had no credits other than that one short story. And, uh, but I felt very confident I could write the book. And so Carol gave me access to everything. Rod's house was exactly as he'd left it. His, even his dog was still there. And wow. uh, you know, in, a, in the, there was a guest um, house back of the main house in Pacific Palisades that Rod used as his office and was lined. One wall was entirely science fiction paperbacks. And if you pulled them out, many had never even been cracked open, but on the inside front cover, all of them were stamped property of CBS because when he was doing Twilight Zone, they would send him all of the science fiction anthologies so he could, so he could see what might be worth acquiring as a Twilight Zone episode. And, uh, it was just phenomenal, and up in his uh, attic there were there were files, and in his garage there were sixteen millimeter prints of Twilight Zone uh, uh, with the commercials and the coming attraction spots, totally as they as they were when they were broadcast. And uh, wow, that was it was, and I would take these uh, stack of these film cans home and put them on the projector and watch them because there was no um, there were no uh, Twilight Zone home video, uh, right? Thing no yet. DVRs or. Yeah. I started the book when I was 21 and it came out, it took me five years to write. And by then, of course, I'd gotten into TV. I was writing for television by the, by the time I was 22 or 23. Uh, I started an animation with Smurfs and He-Man and Super Friends and all that stuff, real Ghostbusters. But, um, but my main project during those five years was the Twilight Zone book. And it's been in print ever since. It's been, I mean, it's fun to be the world ex expert on something of quality. <laughs> I noticed at one point um, that there uh, seemed to be a, a competing author that mm. was writing another Twilight Zone book. I don't remember what it was called, but it seemed like he was uh, correcting you and yeah. trying to trying to pin you down on points and things like that. And, uh, and, and it's sort of I, I didn't even read that book because people came to me and they said, "Boy, this guy's really ragging on you." And mm -hmm. I thought, "Really, do I need?" that energy in my life do i need right. that in my head it's sort of like i wrote that book when i was i started it when i was 21 and there were no there was no internet there was no google there was no way as i said if i wanted to watch uh rod's playhouse 90s i had to go to a university mm -hmm. i could, and watch it on a movieola i mean it was 
And but the one thing I had that no one else had is I was able to interview the writers and directors and producers and actors who made the Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. And now most of them are gone. At, when I started on the book, the only ones who were no longer living were um, Rod Serling, Charles Beaumont, and uh, Montgomery Pittman, one of the writer directors. Everyone else was still with us. And so I have over a hundred hours of, of interviews with the people who made the show. And so maybe their memories at, at points wouldn't be absolutely spot on. So it's possible they would remember something incorrectly and I would quote that, or alternatively I'd get something wrong, but, but it wasn't for lack of trying and it wasn't for lack of heart. Uh, and, and if someone comes out with a new book saying, well, in reality, Mark said it aired on this date and it actually aired on that date or whatever they're saying, yeah. who, cares? who cares? This, this, I have, I have to say, this is a, uh, an absolute must have for anyone in, uh, interested in genre fiction of any kind. Yes. Uh, I Mark, um, uh, stayed up late, uh, uh at 11 o'clock in the Kansas city market. Huh. Um, they would show, um, all night live. Uh -huh. And, uh, the first show that they showed was the twilight zone. Mm. So I would stay up, uh, way past my bedtime <laughs> And watch on an old black and white TV, yeah. which was very convenient Perfect. because it was in black and white. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and I got to see all of those episodes. And then in first hour, you know, uh, I usually fell asleep and uh, mm -hmm. got in sure. trouble for that. But uh, yeah. I wouldn't trade it for the world. No, no. And and again, it's such it's such a great show, and it really holds up. I mean, it's 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 as, it's as popular now as it ever was, and. Uh, you know, it's funny, some people said why this past year I came out with the third edition and some people said, well, why did you come out with a new edition after all these years? And it has a hundred more pages and 500 more photographs and links to audio and video rarities. And the reason I did it was first of all, people kept telling me stories about the Twilight Zone from after the book came out. Uh, for instance, Douglas Hayes, who became a very dear friend of mine, he was a director on Twilight Zone, and when he was directing Eye of the Beholder, one of the great episodes, mm -hmm. he was it and he realized they were going to run short, and Rod was out of town and unavailable. So Doug, who was a writer, a very good writer himself, sat down and wrote an extra scene in Rod Serling's style. And, uh, and if you ever watch that episode, the scene is where the doctor and the nurse are in a break room smoking a cigarette. And uh, and the doctor says, well, I've looked under, under those bandages and her face is a human face. And, um, and Doug uh, wrote that and shot it so that they wouldn't run short. And then they screened it for Rod and Doug was in the screening room just sweating bullets at the end of the episode. Uh, Rod and turned, Rod didn't even notice. No, well, Rod turned toward Doug and said, good scene. <laughs> oh, and so good, good. He's very gracious. But the fun part is that, so I wanted to include some of these stories that I hadn't been, I, had, I didn't know when I wrote the book. And also um, the rarities, these things that I had seen at college, you know, archives, now thanks to the internet, particularly YouTube, they were available. So I wanted to be able to share the actual shows and the actual rarities with um, with the fans. And uh, and that was the best way to do it. And, is there a, uh, is there a, a, a CD-ROM or a DVD that comes with the third uh, edition? Just links, just links. Mm -hmm. If you go to, to marksickby.com backslash uh, Twilight Zone, I think that'll take you to most of those. And uh, But the other fun part was that when I recorded the interviews, I recorded the, them on cassette to uh, transcribe, never dreaming they would have a separate use or a separate value. And then when I, and I've produced all of the Twilight Zone home video versions since uh, VHS. And uh, when I produced the Blu-ray, uh, there's first of all, there's 30 hours of me talking. I did 52 comments. I love it. I love it. Episodes, but also the the interviews I did with Burgess Meredith and stuff I tracked down with Sterling talking about Twilight Zone. You can listen to those as audio extras, and and that's just phenomenal. And I'm so glad to be able to share that uh, with with the fans. You know, it's 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 great. Yeah, it really is. Uh, if there were one writer I could talk to who is no longer with us, mm. it would be Charles Beaumont. Mm. He's one of my literary heroes and yeah. has influenced my mm. own work in ways I probably don't even know. Huh. Why is Beaumont such a standout among the Twilight Zone's writers, and how did his writing affect your own career? What makes his yeah. work so essential? Well, Beaumont, Beaumont was remarkable, and the, the, the fun part of this was I was up in... Uh, Rod Serling's uh, attic when I was researching the book and there was an unmarked box and I opened it and it had scripts for Twilight Zone that were never made. And there were two by Ray Bradbury. There was one by Richard Matheson. There was one by Charles Beaumont, etc. Oh Phenomenal. And um, 
when I finally talked to Ray years later and, and said, what happened between you and Serling? He told me that when Rod sold, see Rod, Rod had never wanted to be a science fiction writer. He was a main, he wanted to be the Arthur Miller of television. And when and he, he was, yes, but when, but, but he was increasingly throughout the fifties, he was the most highly paid and most popular and most sought after writer. Yeah. Yes. But, but more and more as he tried to write about social issues or racial issues or anything, because I mean, my God, the civil rights movement was going on. Emmett Till was murdered. Rod wanted to write about these kind of issues and more and more he was censored and could not get his word. I mean, his scripts were rewritten to a point by him, but, but following the sponsor's notes that he felt totally eviscerated the point. And then it occurred to him that if he wrote it as science fiction, it would go right by the censors. They wouldn't know what he was writing about in terms of the modern day. Mm -hmm. And um, but then Twilight Zone got picked up as a series, the first you know for the first season. And Rod called Ray Bradbury and said, "Help! I don't know science fiction." Mm -hmm. And because what they initially said, uh, had put out an open call for any writers to submit, and they got something like five thousand submissions, and they read five hundred of them, and none of them were any good. Yeah. <laughs> And so talk about called, a slush pile. Right. So he called Ray Bradbury and Ray said, come over to the house and Ray's uh, in Ray's basement is where Ray had his office at the time. And he brought him downstairs and he took him over to his bookcase and he said, read these four books. And he pulled out one book by himself, one book by a British writer named John Collier, and then two by his protégés, Richard Matheson and Charles Beaumont. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and uh, ultimately another one of his protégés ended up writing for Twilight Zone, uh, George Clayton Johnson. Mm -hmm. but, but Matheson and Beaumont and George Clayton Johnson along with Earl Hamner became the core of the writing team beyond Serling writing Twilight Zone. So Serling contractually was writing the majority. He wrote 92 out of 156 episodes. But see what made Beaumont and Matheson uh, irreplaceable was most science fiction and fantasy writers were not also writing TV and film. They were writing short stories and novels, but most of them had no skills at, at, at scripts. Plus, most of them might be science fiction writers, but they might not also be fantasy or horror writers. Right. Beaumont and Matheson, who became very dear friends of each other's, were that they were writers of horror, science fiction, and fantasy. Mm -hmm. They had written novels and short stories and they were writing TV shows and movies prior to Twilight. They were Zone. they were true genre writers, right? They had the muscles that Serling needed because there was there were very few writers who had those qualifications. Uh, because people think of Twilight Zone as a science fiction show, no, it was science fiction, horror, and fantasy, all mm -hmm. three. And so you might do one episode like The Howling Man, where the devil's locked up oh. in a monastery, or you might do another straight science fiction one like Death Ship or I Shot an Arrow into the Air or whatever. And um, so you had to really be able to know all the, and, and you also had to know the rules of Twilight Zone. Uh, Matheson told me you would take one, you would take one notion, just one drop of fantasy and put that into an otherwise totally realistic story. But it wasn't two fantasy ideas in one story. It was one. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you then play that out as logically and as realistically as you can. And with you also, a, with a twist at the end, hopefully yeah, a twist yeah. at the end. Yes. And, and also you had to be able to write to budget because you had to know what they could afford to make. And so, um, so all of these things, but Beaumont was utterly unique. There was no one like him. He had this enormous charisma and magnetism. He had this whole circle of writers around him that consisted of Matheson and John Tomerlin and O.C. Rich and um, George Clayton Johnson. And they would drive around and they would talk and they had all these incredible enthusiasms. And, and But he was the core. He was at the heart of this group of writers and he was inspiring many of them. And Bill Nolan was also central to that. And uh, but but Beaumont really, uh, Ray Bradbury referred to him as a pomegranate writer where he had so many ideas, they were like pomegranate seeds. Mm -hmm. And um, and the, the sad thing of course about Beaumont was that when he was 33, he started experiencing uh, the first symptoms of pre-senile dementia. Yeah. And by the time he was 38 and he died at 38, he was, uh, he was uh, Bill Nolan told me he looked like a hundred year old man. He, he was completely gone mentally and he was all withered up and ancient and it was just this strange tragic tragic death yeah but, but the great part of course is that because matheson and beaumont and george clayton johnson and serling uh wrote for twilight zone and here we are 50 years 60 years on and those stories are still powerful and resonant the twilight zone may well be the best the greatest tv show ever made many people would argue that um beaumont's i would on. Be beaumont's work live on, lives on and the people who first find him via Twilight Zone can then go to the books, can go to his other credits. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, 
Seven Faces of Dr. Lau is another film he wrote, which I loved as a kid and still love. You yeah. know, so, uh, but he was, Beaumont had an incredible power as a writer and, um, you know, and, he, and also the ripple effect of who he inspired and who he, you know. So in terms of, of him, his effect on me as a writer, um, you know, it's just, I learned from Twilight Zone how to have a career in television. So in a way, everything that has come to me since is because of the Twilight Zone, because of George Clayton Johnson, Richard Matheson, Rod Serling, Beaumont, and Earl Hamner. Those guys, you know, um, were hugely influential on me, particularly, um, you know, uh, you know, George Clayton Johnson, Serling, Matheson, and Beaumont. Earl Hamner was a little more rustic. He went on to create the Waltons and Falcon Crest. So he was kind of a backwoods kind of guy who's, who brought another tone to Twilight Rustic, Zone. what a, what a great uh, HP Lovecraft word. Yes, but he was he was a lovely <laughs> man, a lovely, lovely man. He lived into his nineties, and uh, but but he wasn't that same incredible talent and incredible range that Matheson and Beaumont and even George Clayton Johnson had. George Clayton Johnson was a phenomenal writer. Uh, he did Kick the Can and Nothing in the Dark and mm -hmm. so forth. So a phenomenal writer, but not nearly as consistently productive as Matheson or Beaumont in his prime. You know, yeah, it's it's a good thing that uh, Beaumont wrote so much when he did. Yes, he, yes. he really did cram an entire uh, lifetime into a fifteen year period. Yes, amazingly. And the funny thing is, until I wrote the Twilight Zone Companion, there was a great secret which no one had ever spoken about publicly, which was that as Beaumont started to feel the first effects of pre senile dementia, he could still sell stories to television, but he couldn't write them anymore. He couldn't. He didn't have the cognitive ability. So, so for some, for the last season and a half of Twilight Zone, all of his scripts were written or co-written with other writers who were part of his circle. So, for instance, um, uh, Living Doll, Bill Nolan, and yes, but Living yeah. Doll, which is the Talkie Tina episode, was was ghost written in its entirety by Jerry Soule, who was a, another science fiction writer. And finally, because Beaumont had been gone for you know uh, decades by then, I uh, they they decided that they would open up and 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 tell what had happened and it's fascinating in that regard um because his friends really loved him and they didn't know what was happening at the time they thought maybe he was an alcoholic maybe he was having a nervous breakdown finally a psychiatrist saw that it was physical that it was like biological and not not something that could, could be helped with therapy mm -hmm. and, uh, but but it was uh, probably the the aluminum and all the bromo he drove that, he drank for his was, head yes that was that was Matheson's theory that it was bromide poisoning, and it may well have been. But since there was never an autopsy on uh, Beaumont after death, there it will remain a mystery. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it was uh, it was terrible and tragic. But my God, you know, he wrote such an amazing uh, body of work, and uh, it just really—I mean, anyone who hasn't read his work um, should. <laughs> and I, uh, I think especially these days, um, just about everybody should read *The Crooked Man*. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, but you know, there's so many great stories that he wrote. And see, that's the lovely thing about being a writer. Uh, my dad once asked me why I was a writer. And I said, it's the only way I know to stop time. And, you know, so here's these writers work. I mean, you can read Charles Dickens and it's like he's talking to you. It's like telepathy, mm -hmm. essentially. And yet here's someone who's been dead since the 19th century. Or you can read Homer and here's someone who's been dead for, you know, 2,500 years or whatever. It's like, it's amazing the power of the written word and uh and i'm very honored and proud to be part of that tradition you know it's it's terrific i i wouldn't trade for anything and and speaking of that uh congratulations on the uh, success of your efforts on your show space command thank you and condolences on the loss of your friend and actress mira furlon yes that was tragic and i mean the irony was that she died of west nile virus rather than COVID. i mean it yeah. was just you know, she lived in the Hollywood Hills and she was, you know, keeping laying low and a uh, mosquito bit her and, and she died. It's terribly tragic. And she was only 65. She was in great health and vibrant. And yeah, it's uh, it's really, really tragic. But again, we got to work with her and that was that was a, a joy. Yeah. Oh, God, yes. She was the thing that when I wrote for Babylon 5, I, I first met Mira at the rap party for the first season of Babylon 5. And uh, it was at a bowling alley. And I remember telling her when I met her, I said, I'm so impressed with your work and uh, very much want to work with you again. And finally, when when I was able to get Space Command up and running, I met with Mira and I said, um, I'm going to write a role for you. And uh, so we shot two hours uh, with her, the pilot, 
and then I recorded an audio play that was a prequel, and um, uh, and she was in that. And then during COVID, at the beginning of COVID, we did a two-hour bonus episode uh, because all the actors were stuck at home. So we had a, an episode. We wrote a two-hour episode where the actors could shoot their own scenes with their own cameras, and uh, and she was in that. And I was very very glad we got that. But interestingly enough, the next issue of the Space Command comic. I'll show you this. This is a an exclusive to your show. Oh, um, great. Next issue. This is a preliminary of the cover. It'll be a special. Let me get it right. There we go. There we go. It'll be a special Mira Furlan issue. Oh, nice. It, uh, it has a storyline dealing with her character, and it'll it'll be, you know, we'll have reminiscences from people who've worked with her, and it'll be. That's it'll, awesome, Mark. Yeah. That's great. So that'll when, be when, when will that be available? Probably the next couple months. Um, you know, we'll, we'll set up a pre-order at the Space Command store. Uh, people can click through on Mr. Sci-Fi and find it, and yeah, they can get the first issue is already in print, and this will be the second issue, and it's a f part of a four-issue uh, graphic novel that we're doing. That's that that's the prequel. So that's very really, cool. Yeah, yeah, but um, but I mean, again, the lovely part about doing Space Command is that I can cast who I want, I can write what I want, I can do. I mean, it's my baby. I've always wanted to uh, create and run my own shows. And uh, now I have the opportunity, thanks to my my fans. And, well, for uh, for members of the viewing audience that might not be familiar with Space Command, sure. can you can you give us a, a primer on it? How did it yeah. start, and how's it coming? Yes, it's coming great. Um, essentially, you know, when I was a kid, Star Trek uh, presented a hopeful vision of the future. I mean, people forget that Star Trek was made during the Vietnam War, during the height of of the civil rights um, movements, uh, the Watts riots, all that stuff. And yet Roddenberry had the wisdom and the um, understanding that you can create a hopeful future. You can create a future that's worth living in despite the challenges of life, despite the darkness and the evil and all of the, the chaos. And, and Gene Roddenberry, like Rod Serling, had yes. to wrap the morality play in yes. something to get it past the censors. Yes, yes. And, and Roddenberry, well, he was hugely in, inspired by Rod Serling and, and both of them were optimists about the future. You know, they were they were concerned they weren't wearing blinders, you know, but they understood that, that it's up to us to take responsibility for the future we create and that and that love and compassion can be a counterweight against all the evil and chaos. It has mm -hmm. to and um and and it, but but compassion first of all has to be active and secondly it has to be inclusive. And that's what that's what both Rod and um and Gene Roddenberry were 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 they were on a soapbox preaching that and and so star trek made me who i am more than any of the other shows and um mm -hmm. but i was noticing a few years ago that all the science fiction shows tended to be ex that in the you know in in the 21st century t were tending to be extremely dark extremely pessimistic extremely nihilistic and as much as i loved ron moore's Battlestar galactica i kept saying well can't somebody have a birthday party on the show at some yeah. point <laughs> you know <laughs> like they don't have not all of their days are dreary and uh, but I wanted to create something that would be a hopeful vision of the future, and um, so I had this idea for Space Command, and because I run this roundtable where I mentor young people uh, that meets every week, um, I start hearing about crowdfunding, and a number of my friends are showrunners on on many shows, and they when I came up with Space Command, they said let's take it in and let's pitch it and get a pilot deal, but I thought well no if if they commission a script and then they decide not to make the show they'll own it. And if they even produce the pilot and it, you know, they cancel that, they don't green light it to series, they'll still own it. Or, or if they make the show, I'll have to listen to their notes and they may be stupid and, you know, they're, they're writing the checks. And so I thought, I've never raised money before. Uh, let me see what I can do. And um, so we launched the first campaign. The target was $75,000 to raise in two months. We raised that in three days. And, and by the time the campaign ended, we'd raised 221,000. And since then, via a combination of, of Kickstarter campaigns and selling investment shares for like 7,500 bucks each, mm -hmm. over $2 million. And I, uh, I remember the Mr. Sci-Fi episodes when you're walking the dogs talking about yes, yes. sharing, uh, <laughs> uh, buying shares of stock. Yeah. Yes, yes. And so people have bought shares. And and once this show sells, you know, if assuming it sh sells, hoping it sells, they would get a percentage of my producer's net profits. In and the most importantly, yeah. you'll remain in control of your project. Yes, yes, yes. Because again, right now we've created six hours of Space Command. We have the two-hour prequel, which is an audio play and 
a graphic novel. It's the same story. And we've combined those into what's called an animatic, which is like an animated storyboard. Mm -hmm. And um, we've done, so that's, that's about, you know, that's, that's the first story. Then the second story is our two hour pilot, which we've shot. And then there was the bonus episode, which was two hours. And then we also shot the next storyline. It's a two hour story. We shot the first hour and now we've started to shoot the next hour after that. And then um, there's a, I have a cameo in Space Command and someone invited me for an anthology to write a, um, a Space Command story about my character. So I just wrote a short story called Grizzled Space Jockey that uh, <laughs> that, was, uh, that I read on Mr. Sci-Fi. I did a reading of it and eventually we'll do a graphic novel of that as well. And um, so, so it's six hours of material already um, in the can essentially. And, um, and Space Command will be this you know 12 or 14 hour show for the first season. And um, if we keep going like we are, I mean, I've got my own physical studio here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. We're building an alien spaceship that's nearly completed, an interior of uh, this huge interior set that's really cool. And we are building two um, uh, eight foot tall creatures. In fact, I can show you a prototype of one of the heads. That's uh, one of the creatures we're building right now. And I and wouldn't want to run across that in a dark alley. Yeah, but you can sort of see, and this will be eight feet tall and wow. very, very cool. And cool. so, again, you know, it's like I just am. Able, but I was able to create roles for, as you mentioned, um, you know, um, uh, Mira Furlan and Bob Picardo and uh, uh, Michael Harney from Orange is the New Black. Bruce Fox Leitner and Leitner and Bill Mooney and and on and on. I, you know, Christina Moses, who's on Million Little Things, is I she played Sulu's daughter in the Star Trek episode I did, mm -hmm. uh, and I brought her back for Space Command. And uh, you know, and, so is I it can, safe to say that you discovered her? Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. Um, and that got nominated for the Hugo and the Nebula. And again, it was, I'd always wanted to work with George Decay. And um, my friend Michael Reeves came up with a brilliant uh, story. I have a, I have a question about that later. Yeah, so, sure. but, <laughs> but again, it's sort of like the lovely part is that I don't have to listen to a network or a studio insist that, that they don't want to hire the actors I want and they want to hire someone who can't act. I mean, and give you and, notes and right, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and now by extension, you know, we're, we're moving along on Space Command. And now we're creating the Showrunners Network where I'm creating six shows with mm -hmm. Rob O'Bannon and Mark Fergus and Joe Dougherty, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And um, that's moving along. And, and I'm, I'm working now to see if I, we can do a new Rod Serling show. And, um, you know, I'm just, and, and already we just had the first, uh, the second Zoom table read of the pilot of Sweet Haven that my wife and I have written and Rock Neil Bannon and I have co-created. And, and that cast is astonishing. It's I basically I'm creating an ensemble of actors who I can use in different roles in different shows. So that has Bob Picardo, Mike Harney, uh, Barbara Bain from Space 1999 and Mission mm -hmm. Impossible, Veronica Cartwright who uh, from uh, The Birds and Alien, and Marta, oh, sure. Marta yeah, and, and Galaxy of Terror. Yes, and Marta Christen, <laughs> Marta Christen, who played Judy on the original Lost in Space, and you know it just keeps going. I, I, they're wonderful, and and Gates McFadden is in it. I mean, from Star Trek: The Next Generation, I can basically, I just basically call actors and say, hey, I've written a role for you. You want to, you want to play? And uh, and they say yes. You know, yeah. so um, so that's terrific, and it gives me great freedom. And uh, you know, so I I love this. Now that doesn't mean. That I'm not open to selling this to Amazon or Netflix or whomever. I just had sure. a great, I just had a very great meeting, Zoom meeting with uh, with an Am Amazon executive who's just waiting for us to come in with a pitch. And uh, wow, you know, he'll, he'll line up the science fiction, the whole science fiction team of executives. When and Rock and Mark Fergus and uh, and Joe Dougherty, I will, you know, sing and dance. And uh, you mm -hmm. know, so can, but but what but what we're pitching specifically is a slate of six shows under the under the banner. The showrunners network and right and if that works then we'll do another six series and it'll just keep going and uh you know i've already got the back six uh, nailed down so i'll have to i'll have to talk to you after the interview about uh getting in on that yeah yeah <laughs> well, no, it's, it's i'm just trying to revolutionize television because i think that just as authors you know once you once an author starts publishing and selling uh like stephen king or ray bradbury or harlan ellison you have the sense of the authorial voice and and as a fan you can go from from book to book to book to book and it's kind of like you want to see what they're up to you want to see what they're interested in you want to see the 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 arc of their career and 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 but in television the writer is continually frustrated in that because many of their best ideas never see the light of day for instance 
uh, when Sliders was shot, when the pilot for Sliders was shot, another studio did a great pilot called Doorways, which was also about parallel worlds and characters mm. move between pal parallel worlds. And the writer creator of that show was George R. R. Martin. Oh but, goodness! And, but it never got greenlit. He clearly had a plan of where he was going. Sure, that, that's a show I would very much like to do. And um, and so, so but, but don't, yeah. but don't. We we, we want to see him finish his book. Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> I, just, well, I would just I would just take the materials he's already generated and said, okay, what do you have in mind? And and we'd run with it. But the point is that um, that I think that writers in television should have that same authorial voice, and that comes from them forging a link with their audiences where they don't have where the network and the and the studio and the down the platform are responsible maybe for distribution and promotion and and but they're not the ones who get to decide what gets made and what doesn't and, and the fans uh, know to follow the creators yeah. and showrunners yeah. yeah. yes and that's that's why i'm i'm partnering with all these friends of mine uh, all of us adore Rod Serling. All of us are, are modeling ourselves after Rod Serling as showrunners. He was really the first showrunner as we think of it in the modern terms. And mm -hmm. uh, so Rock, you know, I've known Rock since we both worked on the new Twilight Zone and uh, we've been friends ever since. And then now, am I right in thinking that he's uh, the, the actor from Dark City? No, no, that's a different, that's, that's a different guy. Oh, okay. Rock, Rock Neil Band, that's Rufus Sewell. Um, Rock Neil Band. No, I was thinking of the, the, um, the sort of the, the, the lead bad guy who no. was also in, um, uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah, no, that's a different guy. Okay. But Rock, Rock Neil Bannon created, um, Farscape and Alien Nation and Defiance and Sequest and another show called Cult. And he's currently executive producer on Evil on CBS. So he's a very prolific guy. And then Mark Fergus and Hawk Ostby, who are also two of my partners on the Showrunners Network, um, uh, brought The Expanse to television, developed that for TV, and ran it with Narain Shankar. And then they also wrote Children of Men, and they wrote Iron, the first Iron Man movie. And so they're phenomenally talented. And then Joe Dougherty, <clears throat> um, he uh, was executive producer on Pretty Little Liars for its for seven years, and then did the uh, the spinoff show, and he won an Emmy for Thirty Something. And again, a huge um, uh, devotee of the genre and a great talented writer. So and showrunner. So um, so I'm just kind of teaming with people who can who are on my wavelength more than anything else, and who want to do good work and you know not have it screwed with. As an aside, um, I, I uh, in a previous life, was a professional musician, mm. and uh, I wrote a song called Pretty Little Liar. Ah, uh, how but, fun. Uh, that's not really, uh, uh, it's just sort of a coincidence. Okay. And uh, speaking of uh, coincidence, um, my good friend PJ of Orville Nation says, please say thank you to Mark. He and Elaine were so generous in doing interviews with us last year. Well, thanks. I, I, I love, I love this process. I mean, I, I, I was, I'm you know, in the new book, I'm writing green lighting yourself, which is about how to have a career in film TV books where you don't have to wait for somebody else to, you know, wave their magic wand. I talk about that in order to have a successful career in the arts, you need a combination of confidence and humility. Confidence allows you to get where you're going. Humility allows you to learn on as you're as you're on the journey and um so i think uh, earlier when we we're talking about how we're both fans um that's where my head is at it now you know mm -hmm. I, not not just when i was 10 years old and watching star trek for the first time um i think that that science fiction is a wonderful opportunity to do meaningful stories and um, and that segues directly into yeah. my next question very well your episode of star trek deep space nine yes. far beyond the stars is yes. widely regarded as one of the best episodes of the series yes. dealing with systemic racism. Yes. What was it like pitching your story to Ira Bear and how did it change along the way before production? What was it like pitching yeah. to DS9 and, and what did you learn from it? Well, see, the wonderful thing about Star Trek, the wonderful opportunity when you were pitching to Star Trek was um, that you could really go deep, deep, deep into what you profoundly believed and write a story that would change the world. I mean, City on the Edge of Forever changed my view of how of everything. I mean, it was because with City on the Edge of Forever, Harlan's episode of the original show, every TV show I'd ever seen to that point, the hero saved the girl. And in that episode, not only does he not save the girl, but he throws her under a truck, literally. 
Literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and what that told me as a kid was there will be times in your life where you'll know the thing that's right to do and you'll do it, but it'll break your heart. Even though it might not seem like the right thing to do. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so Star Trek wasn't just an hour's entertainment on a given week. It was something that could make the world better. It could change the world. People became teachers and scientists and astronauts. Mm -hmm. Star Engineers. Trek. Yeah. Yes, it inspired them. It opened a door of possibility. And um, so, I, so when, when Star Trek The Next Generation came around, I thought this is a wonderful opportunity. And I pitched over and over and over to that show. And the, the problem with pitching to that show in the first year and a half or so was that every time I pitched, the producer I pitched to would want to buy at least one or more of my pitches. That was David Gerald, Tracy Torme, um, on and on. And mm -hmm. before they could buy it, they would be fired. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> it was a revolving door that first few seasons. And, um, and this happened again and again and again. And finally, finally, Michael Pillar came aboard and uh, he bought, um, you know, first contact from me, uh, and so that was that sort of broke the curse. And uh, though it was funny because it was only after that episode w aired that Michael and I discovered that we were actually cousins, and we didn't know that we were related until that. Really, I was at my aunt. My 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 grandmother's name was Agnes Pillar, and uh, huh. and and when I was at my aunt Yoli's house, my great aunt Yoli, she mentioned Yoli Pillar. She mentioned that Michael had been to visit, and I said, Michael, you mean Michael Pillar? And she said, yes, he's, you know, and I thought, oh, wow, that's, so it turned out we were second. Cousins. What a coincidence. Yeah. yeah. And so then later we had lunch at Paramount and, you know, laughed about that, but interesting. Um, but so then, but so then I was continuing to be a writer producer on these various shows, you know, and um, so I went in and I pitched uh, the, the initial storyline for far beyond the stars. And at that point it didn't deal with race. The basic idea was we see our characters back in the fifties as science fiction writers and the actors would get to be out of makeup. We would see right. what Rene Aubergeois looks like. We would see what Armin Shimmerman looks like. And it would be dealing with why science fiction is important, why it's meaningful. Uh, because Theodore Sturgeon had been one of my great mentors when I was a teenager. And I saw that this giant of science fiction <clears throat> was living this little impoverished life. And I realized that the, that there wouldn't be a Star Trek or a Star Wars if not for all these writers who wrote in the in the 50s and 60s for a penny award, 10 cents award. They were doing it for the love of it. They might publish a novel and it might sell a thousand copies or 3,000. They might get a thousand dollars for a novel. And so I wanted to pay homage to those amazing writers mm -hmm. who didn't become millionaires, who didn't get to live the exalted financial life, but who would not, but who were the bedrock of where we are now. Uh, that most science fiction fans being film, fans of TV and film have no idea of that world. And it had never been presented in film or TV. And I wanted to, to do that. <clears throat> so, so I started by pitching that story and then it didn't sell. And a year later, I, cause I pitched to Hans Beimler who had been my boss on, a, on, on a Beyond Reality when I was a story editor. And, uh, and then a year later, I'm sitting in my office at Universal producing sliders and the phone rings and it's Hans and he says, I have great news for you. Uh, we're, we're, we're buying, you know, far beyond the stars. And I said, oh, good timing, Hans, because I was literally writing two episodes of Sliders back to back. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the only time I had to even meet with the Star Trek team was uh, during my lunch break. And so I drove over the hill from Universal to Paramount and we all had lunch at Nicodell's, which was a restaurant next to Paramount. And it was the entire writing staff. It was everybody. It was Ira Bear and Ron Moore and um, Brian Fuller and on and on, everybody. And, and, and they were all fans of the Twilight Zone. They all owned the Twilight Zone companion. Mm -hmm. And Ira said, we want this to be like a Twilight Zone episode. And, he, and his idea was to put bring the issue of race into it. Uh, the idea that, that essentially, um, you know, Avery Brooks is playing a science fiction writer who's hiding, you know, no one knows he's black and he's writing a white future. And it's about how he ultimately comes to write, um, you know, basically, uh, uh, you know, Deep Space Nine as a science fiction story. And he finally comes to a point where he, he tells his truth. And that's why science fiction is important because it can create a future better than the present that we're in now. And that's exactly what, um, what, what Star Trek did for me as a kid. And, and the moment, and so we just started batting it around over that lunch table over that that you know table in, in Nicodell's, and within an hour it was all nailed down. And in terms of the structure of the story, and I went home that weekend and wrote the story. Now, interestingly enough, 
uh, one of the people who advised me, because I'd listened to a tape that Harlan, one of the inspirations for this story had also been Harlan Ellison. He wrote, he did an, a tape where he reminisced about, for an hour, about writing for the, the magazines in that, in that day. And so, um, so when I was working on the outline that weekend, I called Harlan just to fact check certain things. And, and it was, he was very gracious because Harlan was very embittered about Star Trek and didn't want to ever talk about Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And but I said, I'm doing this outline. I'm, it's about this world you inspired me. And could I just fact check a few things? And he, and he was absolutely gracious and, and wonderful. And then I turned in the outline. It came out really well. And it followed exactly the storyline that we'd worked out. And then I, then Hans called me and he said, well, you know, Ira and I are going to write the script. And I said, well, are you, I was very surprised because I never would get caught off at story. And uh, cause I was a producer on a show on another, you know, at, at, at universal. Mm -hmm. So I knew I had the bandwidth, the ability to write that script. It wouldn't be a problem. Uh, and so I said, well, I want to, I want to write it Hans. I, sh I you know, I've, I've done, you know, it's going to be, a, we, we all knew it was going to be one of the great episodes of Star Trek, even before the script was written. We all knew it was going to be phenomenal. And, mm -hmm. uh, and Hans said, well, call Ira, talk, you know, make your case. So I called is that, Ira. Is that when you found out that Avery Brooks was directing? Well, no, it was at lunch. At, when we were having the lunch at Nicodell's, um, Ira said, uh, we have to find a way to legitimize this where the, the studio, this is going to be a very difficult storyline to get past the studio, to get approved right, by right. Paramount, because it's so um, controversial. And, and he thought, if we have Avery direct it as well as star in it, that will give us the clout. That will allow us to push it through. And mm -hmm. I thought, that's great. I, have, I had no problem with that. So, uh, so then, but when I found out that, that uh, you know, Ira wanted to write it with Hans, I called Ira in his office at Paramount. And I said, I want to write this. I want to write the script. <clears throat> and he said, the reason I don't have faith uh, that you can do that is that you're working full time on another show, and I said, uh, "Well, I have the bandwidth to pull this off. I know I can. I wrote the outline in you know over a weekend." And uh, and he said, "Listen, I'll tell you what. If you quit your job on sliders, I'll I'll let you write the script." <laughs> and I actually considered it for about ninety seconds, and I just couldn't leave leave the people on sliders in the lurch. I mean, I was writing two hours, two episodes back to back. I couldn't screw them over, so I just reluctantly said, "Okay, I I." can't do it and i said i know you and hans will do a great job they followed the outline religiously and uh and it and it was a great episode but the fun part was that when they were shooting the same week that they were shooting that episode far beyond the stars at, at, at paramount they were shooting one of my sliders epi episodes at universal mm -hmm. so i got a photo of myself in the same clothes with both casts the same day and Interesting. And so I went on the set of Far Beyond the Stars. And it was it was on a soundstage at Paramount, but it looked like a magazine office. And all these guys were in suit and tie, uh, you know, playing the roles, Armin and 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 the Neo and everybody. And they were all. They, it was one of the most boring photographs ever. It just looks like I'm with these very boring people in suits. Mm -hmm. and, um, Mark Alamo. Yeah, yeah, all of them. But the um, but the funny thing was, so they. Uh, so they, they were shooting a scene and Avery Brooks kept, kept kind of like looking at me because he didn't know me. Uh, I was friends with Armin, ah. but I never met Avery. So finally he said, okay, he ended the scene. He said, okay, everyone break for lunch. <clears throat> so I walked up and I said, um, hi, Mr. Brooks. I'm Mark Sikra. I came up with this story. And then he said, everybody, everybody stop. And they stopped and he put his arm around me and he said, say to them what you just said to me. And I said, I came up with the story. And he said, he came up with the story. And everyone applauded me. And it was a great moment. And then we all took a photo together. And uh, and it was just, just wonderful. It was a That's writer, awesome. It was a writer's dream come true. And and when the episode came out, I just loved it. And they did a brilliant job. And it was just phenomenal. Um, there were some minor changes between their storyline and mine. For instance, I had Worf as a boxer. And, mm. uh, and uh, basically, he's having a... Uh, a secret re relationship with the the actress, you know, who played the, uh, oh God, what was the name of the character? You know, but she was, but he, she was a white actress and she, in the in the episode, basically had a secret romance with her and the cops find out and they beat him to death. And, with Kira? Uh, yeah, with, uh, not with, who, I'm sorry, which name did you mention? Kira? Uh, no, it was um, the the one who was the, the symbol. Dax? You know? Dax, yes, yeah. yes. And, and Terry Farrell. Right, yes, Terry Farrell. And she, the idea would have been that she was like a socialite and she was in love with this boxer. It was very much kind of inspired by the Great White Hope with the Jack Johnson story. Mm -hmm. But um, but they changed it to baseball, I'm sure, because you know they were more baseball fans and they were thinking more like Willie Mays or whatever. Um, but uh, you know, but for me, 
that had less um, weight uh, within the storyline. But again, I don't, I don't mind. Another a postscript to that is that um, a couple years ago it was, I guess, the 20th anniversary of DS9 or whatever, and they flew me out to the uh, the big convention in Vegas, and they were screening the episode. Then all of us were going to sit on a panel and talk, the cast and writers and so forth, and in the green room behind the stage. They, the actors are talking, and usually there'll be an episode running on the little monitor, but but everyone's talking or calling their agent or whatever. I went in, and it was the cast of DS9 and the cast of Star Trek Discovery, and they were all watching the monitor, and you could hear a pin drop. I mean, when 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 Jake gets killed by the cops, and Avery Brooks' character says he wasn't armed, he was, you know, they're stealing this car, and they say, well, he was armed. They say he wasn't armed, he just had a crowbar to, to, to Jimmy the door, you murdered this kid. I mean, it, it was in the right in the midst of of Black Lives Matter. Matter. If only, if only they could have had the writers of Star Trek Discovery in that room. <laughs> yeah, but it, true. But it was so so fascinating because for the writers on Star Trek Discovery, they didn't even know this episode existed. Right. So to see that and to see the currency of that episode, the fact that if if anything, it was more relevant now, and to have a major studio have the guts back you know in 1998 to have the the guts to say cops kill black people mm -hmm. murder black people yeah it was just phenomenal and so i i applaud ira bear for having the vision and the and the guts you know and the balls to to push that through because that was that was amazing and that's what star trek at its very best is where it says something that's true and you know it's true and it's not just about science fiction it's not just about you know, an hour of entertainment it's, it's the story true. of us today yes, when you see your reality mirrored in a tv show or a movie it's the world saying to you we see you we know you we believe you and that's so vital and um it's inclusion at its very best and uh i'm hugely proud that i was part of that and uh and I, I, I'm, I, you know, but it was because of what Star Trek told me I could be allowed to do. Mm -hmm. If Star Trek said, bring us your best, don't be afraid. And that's something that Rod did too on, on Twilight Zone. You know, when he met, first met with Matheson and Bowman, he said, look, I know you've been writing things like Wanted, Dead or Alive, and you just sort of write what you think the, the networks will, will allow you to do. But don't do that with, with this. With Twilight Zone, write your scripts full out. We will, we will shoot what you write. And Beaumont uh, didn't believe him, but he thought, well, what the hell, I'll give it a try. And when he wrote Perchance to Dream, which was the first episode that he wrote that was, was shot, they wrote it word for word. And again, you'll read the first drafts of those Twilight Zone scripts, and then you'll compare it with the episode. It's the same exact thing. Wow. He really respected his writers. And the funny thing was, on the coming attraction spots on Twilight Zone, Rod would always say, <clears throat> next week we have a great episode written by Richard Matheson or by George Clayton Johnson or Charles Beaumont. He never said, we have a great episode next week I wrote. Never yeah. knew it, never tooted his own horn, but he would always, always um, really tip his hat to the other writers. And when he won his second- Next week we have a very good episode penned by a young writer named Charles Beaumont. Yes, but, but also when he won his second Emmy for Twilight Zone, he held up the award live on TV. This is for the writers. Oh, he said he said he, he addressed them by name. He said George Clayton Johnson, uh, uh, Richard Matheson and, Char Matheson and Charles Beaumont, come over and we'll carve this up like a turkey. That's and right. That, I mean, how gracious! And uh, but again, how cool. I, but Twilight Zone said you can really bring your heart and your soul and the height of your ability to this, and you will not be fucked over. And and the same was true of Star Trek. And I'm so grateful. That, that they gave me that opportunity and didn't blow it. And I, I, I kudos to all of them, all from, from, the, from, from everyone on the writing staff, Hans Beimler, uh, Ira Bear, to the actors who are just a phenomenal ensemble of actors, to, um, to the crew at, and the people like Mike Akuda. I mean, all of them brought their A game. Nobody was just kind of like punching a time clock. Everybody yeah. did their best. Yeah. And it shows, it really shows. It's a, it's fun, for, for the level of production on that episode, they pulled out all the stops. That, that was one of their most ep, most expensive episodes. It's got, they recreate New York. It's got period buses and 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 Hasidic Jews and, you know, no yep. walking on the street, newsstands. It's just phenomenal. Just great, yep. just great. Yep. We, all of us who worked on it feel honored to have been a part of it. We um we don't take that lightly at all. And it wouldn't have happened without, without you, for sure. No. No, because they never would have thought to do an episode set in that time and in that place. And the idea of the actors, we get to see them 
as they look, you know? And that was a thrill for those actors. Armin Shimmerman, I, Armin and I were friends. And when I conceived of that storyline, I told Armin, I said, I'm gonna do an episode where we get to see what you look like. And the funny, the funny postscript to that is, uh, I wrote an episode of, of Sliders called Slide Cage. And because when I wrote for Beauty and the Beast, the Ron Perlman Beauty and the Beast, Armin was one of the characters. He played a character named Pascal, but we didn't know each other at the time. And I wasn't aware that he worked on that. And when I saw the pilot of DS9, my friend Les Landau was directing the show. And I said, I want to meet that guy. I was very impressed with Quark. And I met Armin and we became friends. So when I was a producer on Sliders, I wrote Slide Cage and I wrote a role specifically for Armin and I had the character refer to his favorite TV show as being Beauty and the Beast, not the Disney one, the Ron Perlman one. And it was sort of like a little in joke between Armin mm -hmm. and myself. But there was a one day overlap between my DS9 episode and my Sliders episode where Armin was required by Paramount. And so we couldn't cast him in that role. So mm. during the Sliders episode, different actor playing that role and that, that reference stayed in and there's, it makes no sense at all. Right. The in and, joke uh, isn't really there. Yeah, but it's uh, it's very funny. But uh, but that was how that how that went. But Armin and I are still dear friends, and he's in Space Command now, and I'm I'm happy to work with him any any chance I get. Uh, my friend Steve Mitchin uh, says, "Gotta fly soon," but thanks for World Enough and Time. It was fun to work on something Trek related. Yes, yes. Well, the funny thing is, I never dreamed. I would get to write Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Sulu, any of those characters. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was 10 years old, a friend of mine introduced me to Michelle Nichols when she was on the show, when Star Trek was still running. And it was a hugely uh, uh, formative experience. And it led ultimately to me using Michelle Nichols in, in uh, Space Command. We just shot a scene with her. But, um, but then I And that's, on, that was her retiring role, right? We'll see. We'll see. I, she has... Uh, dementia as most of us know and uh we'll we'll see i think she they shot something for renegades as well but i don't know mm. who's uh who's going to be having those those uh bragging rights if you could call it that but uh but i went on the set of star trek when it was when it was shooting i was there for the last episode turnabout intruder and um but so i so star trek as i said had a huge formative effect but i never thought i'd, I'd write for those those characters and then um, back in the 70s, they were going to bring Star Trek back. It's called Star Trek Phase Two, and they spent a year taking pitches and building sets. And then ultimately, uh, Star Wars came out, and they made the Star Trek movies instead and pulled the plug on that show. But my friend Michael Reeves, <clears throat> who's the writer who brought me into television in the beginning, he pitched a he pitched two great stories, and to that show. And had they uh, moved forward, they would have made those stories. And one of them was a Sulu story where Sulu gets marooned on an alien planet and, you know, raises a daughter and, and then bang, he's back on the Enterprise. And uh, uh, the other story, by the way, that he pitched was a Dr. McCoy story where Dr. McCoy, they've established he's a widower. And um, and then one day this young female scientist brought aboard who's doing research and he has to work with her on this research study and it, and she's a clone of his late wife. And so he's drawn to her of course and loves her <clears throat> and she has no memory of him at all and it was this very interesting story so these were both great stories but i always had wanted to work with george decay and then uh, i was on a star trek panel at a convention with uh, walter koenig and he said you know i'm about to go do this star trek episode in upstate new york and i said what are you talking about and he told me about star trek new voyages which also was known as star trek phase two uh this is around 2005 mm -hmm. and uh and and I went online and I watched the sequel they had done to uh, the Doomsday Machine with William Wyndham in it, and yep. uh, and I thought, wow, that's great. I mean, they they were shooting mini DV, which was you know technically not as good as it might have been, but the sets were great, the costumes were great, and the visual effects were being done by the guy who was working on on Enterprise, you know, and and so forth, uh, Doug Drexler. So I called Michael Reeves and I said, hey, uh, do you want to do that that Sulu story? And he said, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, we'll write it together. And I and I called the the guys in upstate New York, James Cauley, who was playing Kirk in those in those fan films. And I said, listen, um, I want to do this. And Michael and I both wrote for Star Trek: The Next Generation. Michael's an Emmy winner, and uh, and I want to direct it. And I want to shoot on um, uh, high def. I don't want to shoot mini DV. And he said, well, you, if you can get the equipment, that's fine. I said, I can get the equipment. And uh, and he said, okay, great. And so then I went to George. So then I typed up the the outline. And uh, I made changes in it because Michael's story mainly focused on that planet and the years that Sulu spends on that planet. And subsequently they'd done the, the inner light 
on uh, on Star Trek: The Next Generation. So that kind of had been covered. So I decided to make it instead of, about him coming back on the Enterprise as sort of a barbarian and uh, and having a daughter who had only known her mother, who was dead now, and and her father, Sulu, and that was Christina Moses. So Michael and I, um, so I, I typed up the storyline and I drove over to George Decay's house and I sat down with him and I said. Um, you have to tell me right now if you'll do this, you know. And he said, I'm in. So then hmm. his, his agent called to negotiate and he said, well, you know, George will have to read a script before before he commits. And I said, uh, you have to realize we're not going to write the script unless George is in it <laughs> because we're not going to do it unless it's George Takei. Right. Because there's no reason to do it otherwise. And uh, so then George had to trust me. And he had met me when I'd interviewed him for the Twilight Zone Companion. I, I had a party celebrating the publication of the book and he came to it. And uh, so we'd known each other for a number of years. And he said, okay, I'm in. And uh, uh, so then Michael and I wrote the script, it came out great. And I remember delivering it to George's house and he took the script and he said, is this the same story you, you typed up that I read? And I said, yes, it is. You know, he was worried that I was pulling a switcheroo. And then he and my friend Ian McCaig, who's designed Darth Maul and Queen Amidala, uh, among other many major characters in film, he designed the look of Barbarian Sulu and Sulu's daughter. And we went off uh, 2006 in September and shot all the stuff on the Enterprise uh, there. And then we came back. What a great set. set. What a then great phenomenal, set. Phenomenal, phenomenal. And then we came back and built the uh, Su Captain Sulu's ship here in L.A., and uh, and shot it here and had totally other crew here. We had to build that up from scratch. And uh, and then it took me a solid year. I, I, one of the co things I had contractually uh, was that no one could touch a frame of it. That I had I had total final final, final cut. cut. Yeah, yeah. Because I didn't. Because as much as I loved what James Colley and his and his team were doing, I didn't want to put this invest this much of myself into it. Uh, coming out of decades of working for the networks and the studios and not having to be what I envisioned. So I did have that contractually and I hired a, a, an editor and we worked for a year, solid year editing it. And it had, uh, I think over 700 visual effects in that one hour. And uh, Ron Thornton, who designed Which that- Which is more movie, than I think most any network any shows show. had at that time. That's right, at, or even now, frankly. Yeah. And, uh, so, uh, but then Ron Thornton and his team at the Dave School, Ron had designed Babylon 5. Uh, he had worked on Star Trek. So he um, he and his team did the visual effect shots, which were spectacular. And uh, and then I said, then um, uh, I, I wanted to premiere it at Worldcon, the World Science Fiction Convention in Japan. So I arranged for George to be the MC for the Hugo Awards mm -hmm. and, and also be there for the screening, which got a standing ovation, which I understand was very unheard of in Japan. They never yes. give standing ovations for anything, but they gave us a standing ovation. And I said, um, <clears throat> you know, and when I was shooting the episode, I said, George, I, I envision us going to the World Science Fiction Convention in Japan to premiere this, and you'll be answering questions afterwards in Japanese because he's fluent, and I'll be answering questions in, in English. And I said, and a year later, we'll be nominated for the Hugo. And that's exactly wow. what happened. And no, no fan production had ever been nominated for the, either the Hugo or the Nebula. Mm -hmm. Those are the two top awards in science fiction. We were nominated for both. And uh, Outstanding. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm hugely, I'm as proud of, of that episode as of anything I've done in my career. And if you go on Mr. Sci-Fi, on the landing page, you can watch not only the first hour of Space Command, you can also watch that entire episode, World Nothing Time. Uh, I, I think I've seen it three or four times. Yeah, I'm, I'm hugely proud of it. And yes, it did It did uh, start Christina Moses' career. And I then said to J.J. Abrams, uh, you got to watch this actress. She's the most amazing actress I've ever worked with. And so finally, after two years, he watched and he said, you were, you were two years ahead all, of all of us. And he put her on a, a talent deal. And then that ultimately led to her uh, landing on... Um, uh, a million little things on ABC, which she's now starring in. So, uh, so she's phenomenal, and uh, and I love working with her. But I mean, you know, I love working with all the people I work with. They're all, uh, you know, just brilliant, and uh, it's just amazing, just amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was it like working with George Takei, Grace Lee Whitney, and Majel Roddenberry on that? <laughs> it, was, it was great. Well, you know, the funny thing is several things. Uh, when I was on the set of uh, Star Trek on Turnabout Intruder when I was 10, um, I remembered... And that, that was just a visit to the, to the, the set. set. Well, yeah, yeah. I was shooting that day. And mm -hmm. so William Shatner, DeForest Kelly, Majel Barrett, who she wasn't married to Roddenberry at the time, and she played Nurse Chapel, of course. And so I, I heard, uh, it was very funny, I was the only one who heard this, one of the uh, 
crew guys said last show of the season. And Majel Barrett, under her breath, said last show ever. And, <laughs> and then it's ironic that all those decades later, when I did World Enough in Time, I went to her mansion, her house, uh, and she showed me Roddenberry's um, uh, ashes in a little thing on the wall that had gone up in the space shuttle and come back down. And uh, and she I didn't know it came back down. Yeah, yeah. And she maybe they left some of it up there, but um, but but she uh, I recorded her as the computer voice for that episode, and then not long after she she passed away. And uh, so, but it was great to have her in that in that role. Oh and, yeah. Uh, and then Grace Lee Whitney again. I reached out to her, and that was the last time she played Yeoman Rand. But they had established that she was his first officer on ex on the Excelsior. So I thought, well, we should have her on that. Absolutely. And, uh, and then uh, George, with George, he lifted weights for months, getting in shape to play the role. And he looked. Yeah. Great. I mean, he, he was, did. When we were, when we shot that episode, he was sixty nine years old, and you never would have guessed. He looked fabulous, and uh, he was an incredibly hard worker phenomenally committed uh, to the role and I have no nothing but kind words for George Takei he is uh, one of my heroes as he's a hero to many people of course for many reasons. you know one of one of uh, the rumors that I heard that I believe is true that mm -hmm. uh, still makes me sad to this day is that um, after Star Trek 6 uh, there was some scuttlebutt around that uh, they were going to make a Captain Sulu show called yes. Star Trek Academy. Yes. And they decided against it because they thought he was too old. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you several things. And about that was, that. that was years yeah. before world enough yeah. in time. Well, I'll tell you several things about that. One was that, um, before we shot the episode, George, uh, came out as gay and he was very worried that, that might change my wanting to work with him. And I said to him and Brad, who's his husband now and manager, I said, no, it doesn't, it doesn't concern me at all. Uh, I've known you were gay since I saw you in, uh, the, you know, the naked time. I mean, anyone with that incredible a physique would most likely be gay. Yeah. And he was like, really looked great. He put Shatner to shame. And, uh, but that's but true. But, but it was it was no problem at all, of course not. But we did have the conversation about whether Sulu was gay or not. And we both decided, he and I, that Sulu wasn't gay, that he was straight. Right. And yeah. that's what we played. He would have played him entirely differently. Yes. And 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 George, of course, was very offended when they had the the you know Sulu and JJ's shows show be gay, because again, it it wasn't appropriate to that character. And um, but but the fun part was that once we did World Enough in Time, I viewed that as a pilot for the Captain Sulu series, and I contacted CBS, and Michael mm -hmm. Reeves and I actually came up with an entire uh, series bible and full two-hour outline for what the, the for the Captain Sulu show. And um, my friend Winston Engel, Engel also worked on this. And uh, you're gonna uh, mark. I, you're gonna have to slide that to me. I, I'm, I'm gonna have to see yeah. that. Sure, absolutely. But Just it was, between you and me. Yeah, but I pitched at CBS, and um, it was very clear they never intended to do a, a Captain Sulu series. And, of course, now that George is in his 80s, the only way you could do that show is if it were, if it were audio rather than, than a show. But it would have or been... Or like an animated series, yeah. Yeah, but it would have been a great show. I was having it would have. fun with it. I mean, it's uh, there were many, many characters that we had never seen before. And the basic notion was that uh, it follows right on the heels of Star Trek VI, where you know Praxis has blown up and the, the Klingon uh, Empire- and What a rich storytelling environment. And, yeah, well, the basic notion was that the Klingon Empire falls apart and they need the Federation to kind of um, keep them going. And all of these worlds that used to be under Klingon domination are now forming their own governments. And, and they give uh, Captain Sulu's ship the Excelsior, the right to explore Klingon space, all the worlds in Klingon space. And um, and so it's Captain Zulu, it's, it's you know, and then he has a crew made up of a number of people. And one of the fun things I worked out in that, which I really loved was it, for those who are super Trekkies, they know that in, you know, it's, it, there was always the question of why Savick is in Star Trek two and Sa Star Trek three, but at the beginning of Star Trek four, she leaves and isn't part of the adventure. And in the script and in the novel, She's pregnant with Spock's kid because she helps mm -hmm. him through on far as he's far, yeah. mature. And but they took that out of the movie. It wasn't in the movie. But so I followed that up and the idea that okay, uh, now it's twenty years later, and and Savick comes to Captain Sulu and says, "Look, um, 
Spock and my son is a very rebel rebellious young man. He's like 19, 20 years old. And he um, he's sort of like James Dean as a Vulcan. So he's smarter than anybody. <laughs> he's, he's, he's handsome. He's And he knows it. Strong. And, but he's got a lot of anger toward his father, who's always been very aloof, Spock. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he, he's, he entered Starfleet Academy as a kind of a fuck you to his father. But of course he's been on sh uh, assignment after assignment where he's screwed it up because of his anger issues. Mm. And so Savick comes to Sulu and says, can you take him aboard your crew uh, and sort of be the father figure that he's never had? And so he agrees. And so that character, Spock's son was going to be a character in that show. That's and brilliant. It would have been super fun. And the science officer was going to be a, um, a Klingon because my idea was we all, we've seen the warrior cast, but we've never seen the science cast. Yeah. And, and that was a very different kind of Klingon than we'd ever seen before. And so it really had a lot of fun characters and, uh, you know, would have been a fun show. We could have done great things with it. Yeah. That's, uh, it's, it's good to have you uh, sort of uh, uh, clear that up for me because, yeah. like I said, it was – uh, rumor and scuttlebutt, and I never really knew the full story. So thanks yeah. for telling me that. And and I think I think it's it's innate racism of Hollywood. I think that that the fans would have loved a Captain Sulu show. Instead, they're getting the stuff they're getting now, which we can talk yeah. about a lot. But the um, you know, but that would have been a terrific show. And George Takei, I from the beginning, he was such a spectacular actor, mm -hmm. and and I saw his great potential and that's why i wanted right world enough in time he never got his due on the no, on the original I, series well when i sat down with the with the little three pages the precy of the storyline of world enough in time i said to george um you're a brilliant actor you never got the great sulu episode you deserved i said this is it and and that's you know and i kept that promise it is the it is the great sulu episode it is it really but, is yeah and so that's yeah so there apart you go. from apart from the crew actors being different, mm -hmm. if yeah. if that episode had aired in the yeah. original series, yes. no one would have blinked an eye. No, it would have been yeah, uh, well, when, just when canon. Wrote, well, when I wrote with Michael Reeves, when I wrote, we we both, I mean, between the two of us, we probably had like fifty years' experience working in television. And I said to Michael when we wrote, I said, "We're not going to step back from this. We're not going to write it as a fan film. We're going to write this exactly as if we were writing it for the network." And and we both, and it shows. Yeah, and it's and as you said, it has even more visual effects than uh, than than a normal show would. But but again, I, you know, it was like, I mean, the only reason we had other actors playing Kirk, Spock, McCoy was because you know that was what what we had to work with but but we also but months earlier we flew to upstate new york uh, my wife and i who was a director and had been an actress and we did what we called um uh, actor camp with the with the fan actors on on uh, uh, the you know that star trek um, the phase two yeah. yeah and uh so we saw we did we did scene study we did improv with them we saw what their skills were and i wrote to their skills interesting yeah and so i saw that the actress who played uhura was very good i saw that the actor who played spock was very good jeff quinn and uh and james Colley had the passion he was a very mannered actor but we could work around his mannerisms uh quite effectively and so and he and of course none of this would exist without him he's the one who had the crazy idea of making new star trek episodes and right and and to finish like, out the five-year series. Yeah, but I also knew that there was a very brief window that would be a, be allowed. I knew what parent who I mean, I'd worked for the studios. I knew what they were like, and I knew that there had been a time when they were going to conventions telling fans they couldn't make their own Star Trek uniforms. And the only reason they were allowing these fan films to be made is this is between when Enterprise ended and before JJ said yes to making the Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And so they had a, a they had a hole in which there was no new Star Trek. And that's when the fan films started being made. And they thought, and because George Lucas was allowing fan films to be made of Star Wars, as long as they weren't sold commercially, um, and that he was re reviving the Star Wars fan base so they would go to new Star Wars movies, Paramount thought, well, maybe he knows what he's doing. Maybe we should follow suit. But, uh, but, bef but, but before I did, before we shot World Enough in Time, J.J. announced he was going to be doing... Um, uh, the Star Trek movie. So I actually had lunch with him at Disney and uh, I said, look, I'm planning to do this thing with George Takei. Is there, do you have any problem with that? Because I didn't want him to hear about it, not know it's me and pull the plug, you know, have business right. with the plug. Cause I wasn't going to put a year and a half of my life in on it. 
and and have it be you know sweat you know pulled out from under me. So then, but once I did it, once I did it and it got all the accolades and it proved that I could do, I could basically build my own studio one way or another. Um, uh, I, you know, they, they wanted me to direct more episodes of Star Trek, um, the fan films. And I said, no, because I'd done what I set out to do. Mm -hmm. and I, knew that, I knew that it was inevitable. That you had to get back to work with the, the yeah. real, the well, real, I mean, a year I, of your life dedicated yeah. to that one episode. Yes. Yes. But, but also I knew that inevitably Paramount was going to come and kick the shit out of these, these guys. Uh, and they did. They they shut down um, Star Trek Phase Two. They shut down Star Trek. You know uh, the yeah continue. the the new so, fan film guidelines came out and right and 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 so I knew that I wouldn't have an opportunity and there was no reason I'd I'd done what I wanted to do with Star Trek. I mean sure. that version of Star Trek, you know, and uh, that was fine. I mean I I'm totally happy with what I got to do and uh, and that is what allowed the fans to see that I didn't need a studio or a network to create content that was the equal of what I was doing at the studios. Absolutely. And, you know, and so that, that's what led to space command. And, uh, you know, so that was terrific. You know, it was great. Uh, your story for star Trek, the next generation, the episode, not to be confused with the movie of the same name. First yeah. time yes. is also widely regarded as one of the top 10 episodes of that series. Oh, fun. That's great. Of it. You recalled quote, it's very hard to sell to star Trek. Mm -hmm. They've gone months without buying any stories. Yeah. I had done up something like 60 stories and pitching yeah. to the show. <laughs> Usually I sell on the first or the second story. Mm -hmm. I must have run 15 stories by them before we hit first contact. Yeah. Killer liked the stuff. So he kept saying, keep going. Yes. At one point, Ira Bear was joking and said, quote, this guy is an idea machine. Yes. We should just lock him in a room and have him uh, slip paper out from under the door. Yes. <laughs> as hard as it might be to sell to Star Trek, you've done it multiple times. Yes. What's What's the secret beyond persistence? Here's the, well. Here's what I would do. First of all, I would treat it very seriously. So I would I would schedule two weeks solid to just come up with ideas before a pitch. So I wasn't doing working on anything else during those two weeks. And I, I of course was watching all of the episodes. I knew all the episodes back and forth. And I would also frequently call them and say, what do you have in development that you can tell me about? So if they were doing a time travel story, I would know not to pitch that. And then I would start by generating about a hundred ideas more or less. And then like just one liners or, or a paragraph. And then I would start boiling it down and combining them and working up. I would usually have five or six completely worked out storylines that would each run maybe couple pages and then I would have maybe a few paragraphs for some others and then I would just have the one-liners but I would never ever ever even got past those first five on any shot I ever pitched to I would always sell one of those and uh so in this case it was it was it was hilarious it was the day before Thanksgiving at five o'clock and I went into Paramount a.m. and, and Huh? Yes, five. Well, five. It was five p.m. p.m. The day before Thanksgiving, right? So I go into Paramount, and it's Michael Pillar, the showrunner, with all of the writing staff sitting on two sofas looking at me, and nobody wants to be there. It's the day before Thanksgiving. Everyone wants to go home or get. They're on the, watching the clock or yeah. get on the flights back east or whatever. You know, I mean, it's just like the worst possible time slot, and uh, and for some reason I was standing. Everyone else was sitting. I was standing, and I started pitching. And, and, and normally, as I say, five, the five or six in, definitely I would have sold something, but no. But, and, and it's not that they didn't like what I was pitching. It was just they might have a similar thing in development or whatever. So Pillar just said, keep pitching. And I got through the paragraphs. And by now, my whole body is in a cold sweat. And I'm talking, <laughs> for, I'm talking for a full hour. And finally, I get down to the one-liners. And that's when I Bear said this thing about he's an idea machine. And I said, okay. Because the trick with Star Trek, because they'd done so many thousands of stories between the comic books and the novels and all the different episodes and different series. They'd done so much that the trick was to find a hole in their mythology they hadn't plugged, mm -hmm. something they hadn't, something they'd missed. And, um, and I did that with both Far Beyond the Stars and First Contact. And what I said with First Contact was I said, look, you have the prime directive. And mm -hmm. that means that if a culture is on your level or above, you can contact them, like with the Klingons or the Romulans or whoever. If they're below a certain level, 
You they don't have warp capability. Yeah, but they hadn't ever established that. They just at that point they had just said if they're below a certain level, you have to hide from them. Mm. And I said, they've never done a story where a planet, a war, a culture reaches that point where the prime director switches off and the enterprise is sent to make first contact. Mm -hmm. And their eyes lit Which up. Which is almost a duh moment. Yeah. But it was there, but their eyes lit up because it was the idea that none of them had thought of. And and we started talking about it and what we all liked was the idea that it was like doing Day the Earth Stood Still, except where the Enterprise, where our guys are the flying saucer that lands on the White House lawn. Right, and, right. And uh, and so they said, well, we have to clear this through the studio, but I think we, I think this is going to, you know, really, really go. We're going to, we love this. And so then I guess in my memory, they called the next day, but it must have been after Thanksgiving weekend. And they said, yeah, it's a sale. Now, you know, and then it went from there. And uh, but uh, but yeah, it was great to to find that hole in their mythology and and plug it and fill it. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. Great. I, I have to tell you, Mark, I, I must admit, I'm not a fan of modern Trek. No, I, I notice on your YouTube page, uh, Mr. Sci-Fi, you do your best to be an apologist for Discovery and Picard and Lower Decks, but it seems like you share my perspective that it just isn't Star Trek. Well, It I'm seems to be written by people that don't understand Star Trek for people that never watched Star Trek. And to the, to the degree that you feel comfortable talking sure. about it, okay. when did modern Star Trek go off the rails? And do you <laughs> think it'll ever return to Gene's vision? Or is the Star Trek that we knew and grew up with dead? Um, good question. I don't think of myself as an apologist. I just think of myself as someone who is both a viewer and someone who's made television. So I'm understanding the difficulty in making anything that's good. Uh, you know, it's like it takes, it's, you know, stuff that's great isn't great by accident. It means that everybody along the line made the right choices. The actors, the writers, the directors, all the crew guys, everyone did their job, you know, and, um, and it, all you need is one shitty actor or one producer who's an idiot. You know, it doesn't take much. For instance, Night Gallery. Uh, why was Night Gallery not as good as Twilight Zone in terms of production? It's because Jack Laird was knocking back a, a quart of vodka a day, and he, <laughs> he and he didn't respect Rod Serling. You know, it's it's not a mystery when you really look into it. You know, the guy was a major alcoholic, and so okay. But uh, but Star Trek Discovery and Picard, I haven't watched Lower Decks, so I can't opine about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I can't recommend it. Well, okay, but. <laughs> But here's my thought about, and, I, and I've only started to watch the third season of Trek. I know they're about, of Discovery. I know they're about to have the fourth season. I know they're both about to have the second season of Picard. And they're doing Strange New Worlds. Um, which I think the one thing that everyone should point out about Strange New Worlds is it's the first time I know of that a pilot was shot in 1964 and greenlit in the next century. <laughs> That's a good point. And and boy, if that thing doesn't say created by Gene Roddenberry, I don't know what it should say because it's like it's the it's Captain Pike. You it's know, still I mean, being made by the people that made Discovery, yeah. so we'll we'll have to see. But it's definitely a problem. It's definitely a problem. Here's here's some of the things that I think are wrong. Um, and and again, I I know I know I mean Doug Jones, who's a star in Space Command, is a star on Star Trek. Uh, Discovery. I think he's terrific. I, I love Doug, and I think his character is one of the most. He's popular. always good. Yeah. yeah, and and I think his character is also one of the most compassionate, and I think that really works because Star Trek. What Star Trek is about is being compassionate and selfless, recognizing that we are a family and we have to be there for each other. Mm -hmm. And it's not about selfishness. It's not about pettiness. It's not. It's, there's so many things Star Trek is not, and so many things that it is. And, and the reason Star Trek The Next Generation worked was because Geordi and all the rest, Picard, everyone from the top guy to, you know, Data, they're all, they're willing to, 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 to give up their life for the others on the show. You know, mm -hmm. they, there's a real compassion, there's a real connection, there's a real, they're, they're friends, they're family, they value each other. Um, and one can pay lip service to that on Discovery or on Picard, but it's not true. You know, I mean, you know, there's Michael, and she's, you know, 
constantly not listening to anybody else, constantly taking her own path, constantly uh, disobeying orders, you know, and, 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 and then there's, you know, the mushroom guy, the fungus thing. I mean, my God, Gene Roddenberry talked to the Rand Corporation. Spore drive. Yeah. I mean, Gene Roddenberry talked to the Rand Corporation. He was talking to NASA. You know, warp drive is a fictional construct, but at least it's based on a plausible, um, they've actually come out with one. Well, now. Yeah, it's, it's based on pl pl plausible extrapolation of current science, but, 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 the, the spore drive, I've never read anything about mushrooms being able to transport you across the galaxy. There's a mycelial network in space, don't well, you know? No, I guess so. <laughs> and, and, and bugbears and all this craziness. And then, and then they, have, they have the Red Angel in the second season. And it's just, I mean, I, I challenge almost anyone to say what those plots are because they are just twisty, turny monsters. And the third season, I don't know, maybe it's better, I don't know, but I don't find myself engaged in these people. And I don't find, and when they have conversations, even character uh, scenes, they're not interesting character scenes. They're talking about trivial bullshit. And yeah, m most of it seems to be people talking about their emotions in hallways. Yes, yes, and but even even when it's plot specific, it's just what are the rules here? What what the fuck? You know, it's like the third season they're trying to get the Federation going again. That's not something the audience gives a shit about. Or right. when they're talking about why the Federation is important, it's lip service. It's like no. And see, but, but part of this, I think, and again, it's just an opinion. And you know, I think you have to care deeply about something and understand it profoundly to be able to write well about it. And and you know Roddenberry and 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 Serling, those guys were in World War II. I mean, when Rod Serling was a teenager, he was jumping out of airplanes into jungles full of people trying to kill him. And Roddenberry was was a bomber pilot. These they understood life and death. They had seen it close up, mm -hmm. and they had genuine courage. And, and on the new shows, they just seem to murder people indiscriminately. Well, but I mean, more than that, most TV shows and movies are written by people who are writing derived, they're coming up with stories derived from other people's TV shows and movies. They haven't, for the most part, had a depth. Had their own experiences. Oh, and, and, and one thing that we know as writers yeah. is write what you know. Yes, well, Ray Bradbury was uh, a mentor of mine and he said, look inward, don't look outside, look inward. Find the things you care about strongly. Find the things you uh, that upset you strongly or or that you love passionately. Write from that. Write from your experience. And it doesn't mean you have to write solely what you know. Like Rod Serling said, I don't. He said his advice was write what you know, or better yet, write what you feel. Hmm. And that was absolutely correct. And you know, but again, it's like let's say you haven't been in a war. I haven't personally been in a war, thank God. But but I know, I, but I have had emotionally bruising experiences. I have experienced anti-Semitism, whatever. My family, uh, most of my family was wiped out in the Holocaust. And if, yep. my mother, if my grandfather hadn't brought my mother here, or let's say she, my, my grandfather came here in World War I, and, and he brought my grandmother and my aunt here, and my mother was born in Chicago, all of them would have been exterminated. Everyone mm -hmm. else was exterminated by Hitler. So my mother... Who was born in 1923 same thing with my family with yes. my father's family yes and so and so when we have totalitarianism or you know nationalism rising their heads and and when we have the the darkness of racism and all of these things i can very much feel that internally as as a person and it's fascinating because when ira bear said well let's do this thing about race uh for far beyond the stars i thought great i, I recognized that it made the story better and deeper and um, I was all, all aboard for that because, again, I understood the power of a positive model that has resonance, that's about something. Um, you know, what, like I, one of the things I talk about is um, frequently is most people don't understand that when Martin Luther King gave his, I have been to the mountain, I've looked over it and seen the promised land, he's telling a science fiction story. Hmm. He's saying, here's a reality that does not exist, but could in the future if we're brave enough to make it happen, mm -hmm. where the, the, son, the, the descendants of slaveholders and the descendants of slaves sit together at the table of brotherhood, we can have a better future. And when what when an what, interesting take on that that is. Yeah, but that's that he is he's positing a future that's better, a hopeful future. And in his visualizing it, he helped to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Other people could see that potential, that possibility, and help to make it happen, just as Star Trek did, just as Twilight Zone did. And, and so whenever anyone is on a TV show and they blow that enormous opportunity, and it doesn't mean you're on a soapbox. It doesn't mean you're, you're, you're giving us a, a lecture because that's not going to work. 
it means you tell a story that moves people to tears. Mm-hmm. They recognize and hopefully the sticks with them. Yes, yes. And but there's so many people who watch Star Trek and are and lived very different lives from what they would have had otherwise. I mean, so many people, not just the ones who became teachers or scientists or astronauts, but the ones who raised families and and saw the potential of that. The ones who looked at people from other communities and said they're part of my family, the human family. Mm-hmm. They understood. They understood that we're all in this together. And and that's vision. That's a vision that creates a world. And I take that responsibility very seriously. And I'm so glad that those who came before me did the same. Yeah. That's what I think, and that's why I think they're lo- losing a great possibility with Star Trek Discovery or or Picard. You know, maybe Strange New Worlds will be good. It's all it all boils down to the writing staff, you know. We can only hope. We can hope. You know, but I mean, people often say to me, well, why don't they hire you on Star Trek? It's like, well, I don't know. Tell them to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, if someone said, here, you want to you want to see what you can do with this? Sure. I'd, I'd come aboard. I'd, I'd give it a, a college try. I think I could make it better. We, we had a, a note from the chat earlier from uh, PJ of Orville Nation. Mm-hmm. I nominate Mark Zakri and Joe Malazzi to run Star Trek. Well, you know, yeah. But again, you know, they... Who do they hire? They hire the people who are who are making money for them, the network, you know, or the studio. And they're not going to give it up. No. And again, you know, it's it's remarkable when something comes out well. And we have to applaud all of those wonderful things that, that have made us who we are. Um, but, you know, you can't see TV and film are very difficult because it takes an army of people to do their best work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you have to be willing. You're only as good as your weakest link. Well, you're in a collaborative medium. And. And that's why I've chosen uh, to be the boss, you know, to be the king in my own little kingdom, because mm-hmm. um, you have to take responsibility. If you don't take responsibility, then it, you can't blame it, blame the machine if it fucks things up. Mm-hmm. If you take responsibility, I mean, every every single decision on Space Command ultimately is my decision, you know, and, um, you know, so the casting, the design stuff. The, the buck stops the- here. Yes, it does. And and in some cases, I might say, well, that could have been done a little better, maybe if we'd had, you know, millions of dollars, you know, or whatever. But but given I'm using all my ability and all my um, experience. Uh, well, yes. And ingenuity and and, you know, all of that. I mean, to call someone up and say, give me money. You know, it's not it's not the most the most easy thing to do. But um, but people do it because they invest in me and in the vision and they like what I'm doing. And um I'm honored. Anyone who gives Space Command a dollar or, or half a million dollars, I mean, you know, they could have spent that money on other stuff. I mean, I'm I'm honored that anyone sends money my way because they don't have to, you know? And uh, so I'm I'm grateful and, and I don't treat that lightly either. Uh, and switching directions a little bit. Sure. You you wrote and worked on several episodes of Sliders. Yes. Which remains one of my favorite TV shows ever. Thank you. Uh, tell us about working with creator Tracy Torme and what allowed you to create so many stories for that show? Well, um, I was brought aboard. It was very funny. I um, I uh, was hired. There was, a, there was a series of books called Animorphs that, Scholar, uh, that Scholastic did. And uh, they were looking for a writer to basically adapt the storylines and lay out all the outlines of the series and write several scripts that would set the pattern for the show. So I flew to, I was flown to New York by Scholastic. I met with the people there. And then two weeks later, I was going to fly back and lay out the show. I got hired to do that. So I was reading 15 novels of Animorphs in a week and laying out, you know, I think I had one or two weeks. I can't remember. It was a very tight time frame to lay out all of the storylines and, and the first season. So in the midst of that, my agent calls and says, hey, I've, um, you're, they're looking for a producer on sliders. And uh, so you, you need, um, you know, I've set a meeting for you and you have to go in with some ideas. Now I'd only seen the pilot, you know, three seasons earlier. And, uh, you know, uh, and that was all I'd seen of the show. So I, so I said, well, I can't do it. I said to my agent, normally I, could, I would work up some storylines I can't, I don't have the time. Uh, and um, these, then Scholastic has hired me. He said, well, do what you can. So I said, okay, okay. So I watched episodes and I, I got a sense of who the characters were and what their names were. And uh, and this season I knew uh, Fox had canceled it, Sci-Fi had picked it up. And instead of it being shot in Canada, it was gonna be shot on the Universal lot in Los Angeles. And so 
so I went and I met with the showrunner, David, David Peckinpah, and I said... And there was, there was a cast uh, change, as I recall, as well. Yeah, yes. Well, Tracy Torme was no longer on the show, mm -hmm. and, uh, and John Reese davies had left. And so, so I went in, and uh, because I had nothing to pitch, I, I, I'd heard of a trick you can use to forge rapport with someone. And it's basically whatever they say, you repeat back to them using different words. Mm -hmm. so David Peckinpah said, you know, this season, we're going to have these characters called the Cro-Mags, and they're going to be our villains, and they won't appear in every episode, but they'll appear throughout the season. And I said, that's great, because you um, you don't have, you, you because you have a recurring pro, you know, antagonist, it'll give a, a through line to the show, but you don't have to have them in every episode. He said, yes, that's right, exactly. And then he said something else, and I repeated it back in the same words, uh, just saying it slightly differently. And he said, and he stopped me and he said, you know, I'm scheduled to meet with a number of other people, but I'm going to hire you. You're the first I, person that really I, understands. I get, <laughs> I get a great feeling off of you. And I, I dressed very well. And uh, the one thing I did say that was original with me is I said, look, you're going to need a science fiction guy. You're going to need to know who comes in and pitches crap. That's just a science fiction cliche and who doesn't. So, so I left, I went off and I flew to New York uh, for my second meeting with Scholastic and my agent called and said, you've got the job on sliders. So great. So, um, so with sliders, you know, it really fallen out of favor because the previous year it's sort of been movie ripoff of the week. So they would do Twister or they would do Jurassic Park and the, the actors weren't happy and the fans weren't happy. So I said, okay. Um, so we sat down, it was a very small writing team. It was just me and Bill Dial and Chris Black and David Peckinpah was the showrunner. And we met with all of our actors one-on-one -on -one and we said, our leads, and we said, what do you think is working? What do you think is not? And they told us. And so I said, okay, well, we're gonna fix it. And then I went to the World Science Fiction Convention. I met with the Sliders fans and I said, look, tell me everything you don't like about Sliders. And they told me, and I said, I agree with you and we're gonna fix it. So come back and trust us. So, um, so they did. And the premiere of Sliders that year, the fourth season, it got the highest rating of anything on the Sci-Fi Channel ever. And uh, and we did 22 episodes, and I wrote a bunch of them and rewrote a bunch of them, and I, overall I was about responsible for about 19 of those 22 in one way or another, and my name's on all of them as a producer and some of them as a writer. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Uh, you've had so much success in Hollywood that you've even taught other writers and showrunners how they can benefit from your career. Yeah. What are some of the things that you teach that students of creative writing, screenwriting, and genre fiction in general might not know? Hmm. Well, uh, as I said, I've sold a new book to Silman James called Greenlighting Yourself that talks about all of this stuff. And mm -hmm. I'm trying to write in that book thing advice that you don't get normally in how to have a career in Hollywood books. So I'm doing one about recovering from failure. So like if you have a, something come out and it's a disaster, how do you actually keep your career going? I have another one about um, having a life whether or not you're successful. I have another part about when you are working for yourself as an artist and you wake up and the whole day stretches ahead of you, how do you actually have a work schedule rather than just sitting and watching TV all day? you know, and, um, and, and so forth, you know, and, um, and so the things I would suggest are start at the top. So don't expect that you have to write crap or work on crap at the beginning of your career and that you have to just accept whatever's given, thrown your way. What you have to do is think about the thing you would most want to create, most want to work on of everything in the universe and do that. Because if, like, for instance, when I wrote the Twilight Zone Companion, I had only sold one short story and never taken a journalism class. If I had asked a hundred people what chance I had of Rod Sterling's widow when she'd already turned down, you know, writers from the New York Times and other places, uh, what chance I had of getting Carol Sterling, Rod's widow, to let me write the book about Rod in the Twilight Zone, a hundred people would have said, you have no chance. But what they didn't know was how determined I was and how mm -hmm. willing to work hard I was and really prove that I could do this. And uh, so I, my vote out, outweighed everyone else on the planet because I was, I was voting on what I was gonna do. So create the work that you love, create the work you're committed to and passionate about. And then, you know, your job as a writer is to see something in your head and turn the whole world so they can see it, what's in your head. And, and the lovely part is when you do it right, it lasts for decades and decades and decades and often beyond your lifetime. And so there are things that I wrote 
when I was, you know, like as I said, I started writing the Twilight Zone Companion when I was 21. And people are still buying it and reading it and enjoying it and getting benefit from it. I wrote episodes of Smurfs or Super Friends or real Ghostbusters or He-Man, any of that stuff when I was in my early 20s, you know, and and people are still enjoying it and 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 being entertained and certainly far beyond the stars and many of the other things I wrote when I segued over to live action. I mean, someone was just complimenting me on an episode of Space Precinct I wrote. I mean, mm -hmm. my God, you know. <laughs> you it's know. a popular show. It was fun. It was fun. And... And uh, you know, I think it it, it, lost, it wasted a great opportunity, but but still, it had you know its charm. But the, but the point is that so I would advise people start at the top of your game because if if you want to be at the top of the the heap, show that you belong there. And the way you can show that you belong there is by creating something of merit. And now that we all have cameras in our pockets, now that we can edit on a Mac or whatever. Uh, and then and put it up on the internet. There's no excuse not to. Back when you had to shoot 35 millimeter or 16 millimeter, and everything cost millions of dollars, there was no distribution network other than the studios and the networks. You had an excuse, but now you don't. And mm -hmm. so, if you, wanna, if you wanna want something to happen, make it happen. It's up to you. And and so that's what I would say. Don't. There there's two kinds of people in this world: those who live in the excuse to explain why they didn't do the hard work, and those who take it on. And when I was doing the, the, the Sulu episode, the Star Trek episode, it was an incredibly difficult shoot. And I remember saying to myself a mantra. And the mantra was, I am made of iron and nothing will stop me. Mm -hmm. And I really embraced that. And it was very hard work. I, it's funny, there was a point of exhaustion where whatever I was feeling, I was very emotional. I would start to cry at the drop of a hat. And I couldn't, I had no way of masking my emotions. And I thought, this is what it'll be like when I'm 80. <laughs> <laughs> And but I thought because I was so exhausted, I just was running on just vision and adrenaline and 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 my experiences and making it happen. And and the but the fun part, fun thing with that was, and initially when we got on the set up in upstate New York, it was the pros that I had brought, the professionals in various positions, and there were the fans who had showed up kind of for Star Trek camp to work on it, and they were very kind of two different camps. And, and a little bit at odds with each other because I was just a certain way of doing things and the fans weren't used to that. But so I said, let's have a feed from our set to the outer lobby so that whoever's not on set at that point can watch the, what we're creating because I knew we were creating something that would be phenomenal. And as everyone started to see what we were creating, all of a sudden they merged and we were all on the same page to create something wondrous. And we succeeded, and we're all so proud of that. That's that such a great that. idea. Yeah, but that was how we united. It was we united because we were all committed, and no one was more committed than me. I mean, I was, I'd go to the mat for it, and I did. So you know, that's that's how it works. You know, so just don't take excuses. Don't let other people uh, rain on your parade. I mean, just you know, it's a wonderful time to be alive. It's a wonderful time to be creating content and. Uh, you know, we can all have a channel on YouTube and, you know, go for it. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to uh, talk to your experience on Babylon 5, oh. uh, The Survivor. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what was it like working with Joe Straczynski? And what's your experience working on Babylon 5 in general? Sure. Well, I, um, I'm the only writer who wrote for both Deep Space Nine and Babylon 5. And so I got to study the production models of both. And it was highly instructive for what I'm doing now in Space Command. They both were set on standing sets, on sound stages. The big difference with Babylon 5 is it was able to do more visual effects, more stunts, more uh, alien prosthetics uh, for about half the budget, less than half the budget of, of Deep Space Nine. So I talked to John Copeland and found out how he did it. Um, in terms of Joe Straczynski, I met Joe when we were all writing animation. And I, in fact, Michael Reeves and I recommended him to Filmation at the time. And he started writing and story editing uh, animated shows. And in fact, I wrote episodes of Real Ghostbusters where he was the story editor. And we were very, very good friends. And uh, I was hired to develop a show called Captain uh, Power. And it was, uh, you know, all they had was Mattel was going to be financing it. it. And all they had was the weaponry and sort of the world that was kind of post-apocalyptic and the villain. And I spent a year writing, developing that show, creating the characters, creating the backstories, creating everything other than the weapons. And, um, and they wanted me to story edit it. And I was writing features at the time and not available. And they were going to hire someone who was going to just wreck the show. 
And Elaine, my wife said, you have to tell them. And well, I said, I can't tell them unless I have someone to plug in. So I went and I said, look, there's a writer who's never worked in live action. Uh, he's only done animation, but I'll guarantee him. If he can't do the job, I'll step in. And that was Joe Straczynski, I, I guaranteed him. And uh, so Joe came in and he was of course, very, very good at this. And uh, so he came aboard, story edited, and I wrote, actually I wrote a number of scripts for Captain Power. Uh, the only one that got made uh, well, there were uh, two or three that got made, but then Joe in Captain Power, he, it was the producers he ultimately did Babylon 5 with. It was John Copeland and uh, Doug Netter, and it was the Ron Thornton was doing the visual effects. Interesting. And, uh, and so that was his core team that led to Babylon 5. And I actually read the Babylon 5 pilot five years before they sold the show. And wow. I recognized that it was a great script. And I, uh, so then um, when, when Babylon 5 That's, got uh, on the edge of midnight, something like oh, on the firing line on the firing yeah. line yeah and uh so i uh, when they shot it uh the studio waited to see what the what the response would be with the audience and so they tore down all the sets it was a year from when they shot that pilot to when it actually green the show and so when the show got got up and running joe offered me a, a story um assignment a script assignment and uh so i came up with survivors and uh uh, but I, as I was writing it, I went on the set because I was just building the sets, and I, I sat down. I went um, met with John Acavelli, who was the uh, set designer and uh, production designer, and he rolled out the blueprints because I needed to see if what I was blocking out in the scenes was accurate to the sets they were building. And um, so uh, they shot the episode, and I loved the actors. I thought Londo and Jakar, uh, all these actors, you know, Mira Furlan, of course, brilliant ensemble, wonderful, brilliant. And, and in fact, I took, uh, when, when they were shooting Babylon 5, I took um, the actor who played Jakar, uh, Andreas Gutzelis, to lunch at Paramount, or I think, was it Paramount or Universal? I think it was Universal at the time, because I admired him and I very much wanted to work with him more. And, I, and he told me, and I was shocked, that I was the only producer who had ever taken him out to a meal. Amazing. Wow. He's such a talented actor, so wonderful as Jakar. Were then, you responsible for getting him on Star Trek? Um, no, no, I okay. wasn't. And, and, but, but, but sadly he died, of course, not long after Babylon five and they've had a terrible record of their, of their stars passing away much. I mean, it's amazing that the next generation cast, you know, I think they're all still with us mm -hmm. and, uh, and so many of the actors, the leads on, on Babylon five are no longer with us. I don't know why that is, but it's, it's really unfortunate, really sad, but, um, but he's one of the ones I actually would have worked with as well had he, had he lived. So. Um, but but I loved I loved working on both DS9 and Babylon 5. Joe Straczynski, I think, is um, we're all of as I say, we're all of us children of Rod Serling in one way or another. And I know mm -hmm. that Joe, I'm one of the very few writers other than Joe Straczynski who wrote for Babylon 5. I mean, there's Neil Gaiman and Dorothy Fontana and uh, you know, a couple others, but but Joe ultimately on the first cup first season, Joe wrote a bunch of them, and he was trying to get up to speed where he could write essentially all of them. And that's ultimately what he did. The sad thing is, of course, that he had laid out a five-year arc, and then he really came to believe that they were going to cancel it on the fourth season. So he hurried up and finished it, and then turned and picked it up for a fifth season. But he had already kind of finished that Shadow War arc, and it's mm -hmm. unfortunate that he didn't know he would get his full five years because I think it would have been structured and paced rather differently. Mm -hmm. But but still, given what he's had, he did amazing things with it, and I'm very very glad he got to become who he wanted to be. Do you know is there is there any truth to the the rumor that he's uh, uh, using the um, the remastering of Babylon Five to gauge interest in uh, another show, um, not necessarily Babylon Five, but another science fiction show? That would be more what Warner's would be doing, you know, or or you know, um, I rather than Joe. I mean, Joe is. You know, I mean, he's like all of us. He's trying to sell things that are of interest to him. And if someone gave him full power to create whatever he wanted and, and the bankroll to do it, he he would. I mean, it's just because we work in an art form that costs millions of dollars, we, uh, you know, most of us don't have the money to finance everything we want to make. And uh, unlike Howard Hughes, for instance. But, um, you know, so we do what we can. I mean, I'm very lucky that it turned out I had a knack for raising money. Uh, which allowed me to do Space Command and now the Showrunners Network and all the things I do. But uh, but we're all of us. I mean, we all of us. Michael Reeves and and Joe Straczynski and just there was a hundred, ton of us who came up in um, in in television together. You know, and and that also then became uh, Ron Moore and 
Brandon Bragg and all these other people I know rock Neil Band, and we all sort of were that generation, and we all knew each other and admired each other. And we, were, we were all our goal for all of us was to create and run our own science fiction shows, and many of us got to do that. Mm -hmm. And very, I mean, Ron Moore, you know, did Battlestar Galactica, and now he's doing For All Mankind, and you know, all of us um, were inspired by Serling and, and secondarily by Gene Roddenberry, and. Um, I know it's miraculous. Mark Fergus, my friend who, who created and ran, ran the Expanse with, uh, you know, Hawk Osby and Lorraine Shane Carr. Thank and, goodness for the Expanse. Yes, yes, because that's a show. You can fault it this way or that, but it's a show that's being done correctly. You know, they yeah. know where going. There's a point to the characters. The you science know, is important. The yeah, physics are in, important. In, the, in a way, the Expanse is almost like Star Trek for for now. Um, yeah. You know, but it's uh, but it's a lot grittier. But um, but it's much a map, much better show than Star Trek Discovery. God knows. Oh so, yeah. yeah, yeah. But that comes from having a small writing team and having the vision, sharing the vision. But also, it comes from uh, following novels that already chart that path. It knows right. where it's going, and that's great. Uh, we do have to wrap up soon, okay, sure. um, but I wanted to ask you, Mark, uh, mm -hmm. what is next for? Uh, for Mark Scott Zacre, yeah. uh, what's what's next for the Twilight Zone Companion? What's yeah. next for you in 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 your career? Well, the, immediately, of course, I'm, this week I'll be finishing the new the first draft of the new book, Greenlighting Yourself. So I'll be getting that to my publisher soon, and they'll publish it. Um, in terms of Space Command, we're going to be shooting the entire first season. We roll camera in the next few months on more of it, and you can watch what I've put out so far on Mr. Sci-Fi. So I urge you to subscribe to Mr. Sci-Fi. And then the Showrunners Network, um, it's moving forward. And we're going to be shooting all six pilots, two-hour backdoor pilots. And uh, and one of those shows will be narrated and feature uh, un unmade material by Rod Serling. So, And Rod dictated all of his letters, all of his scripts, everything. So they thought those recordings were lost. And they found 200 hours of them. And we will be utilizing that. Wow. The Rod, it's called Rod Serling's After Twilight. And it'll consist of scripts by Serling and narration by Serling, and also scripts by by writers uh, like Beaumont and Matheson, and 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 new writers like Neil Gaiman and so forth. So it's going to be a spectacular show. That's outstanding. Mm. <laughs> so you know, there you go. That's great, uh, Mark. Where can people find out more about what you and Elaine do? Mr. Sci-Fi. Go on Mr. Sci-Fi, and uh, it's on YouTube. Just type Mr. Sci-Fi M. R period S C I hyphen F I. And that's pretty much the, the that leads you down the rabbit hole. <laughs> and uh, and if you want to reach me for any reason, my email is markzickby at gmail.com. And uh, if anyone wants to buy shares in Space Command, they're 7,500 bucks and uh, it helps make the wheels go. So uh, we really appreciate it. Very good. Well, the link is in the chat. I do want to thank you so much for spending time with us and yeah. being on Masters of the Genre. It's been wonderful talking with you. you uh, I hope to do so again. And um, I want to wish you a wonderful uh, rest of your week. Great. Thanks so much. And I've really enjoyed it. And, uh, and thanks for doing what you do as, as well. And uh, thanks to everyone in the chat. I uh, appreciate everyone being here, and um, we will see you next time. Bye, guys.